All right, so we starting up this live chat. I see one person, four per people. All right, we're we're going. Hope everybody's doing well. It's been a crazy busy day here. Hey, B Lord. Oh, seven one. And hello, America. Hello, Poland. Uh, you guys are pretty cold over there. I'll bet already. It's it's pretty cool over here. Hey, Farmstead Smith. Hope you're. Doing good out there in Oregon. Hope, hopefully those fires have calmed down a little bit. I, I really haven't heard any recent news on that. Hey, Adam and Jeremy. Get a lot of people rolling in. So what's up, Parker's Bees says. So um, bees have started robbing here a little bit in some yards. It's really interesting how five, eight miles you know, can make a huge difference in how the bee yards are acting. And I went to one today. We... Did the last mowing and weed eating in that yard for the year. Um, checked honey stores and the bigger colonies obviously had more weight on them. And some of them don't want to eat any feed at all. And some of them um, need probably a good 20 pounds added to them going into winter. And that yard's got about 52 colonies over there. And uh, it's just really interesting um, to see. Now, as far as pollens are going, man, the bees are just four or five different varieties of pollen. It's beautiful. But the nectar is really starting to diminish a little bit. And some of the bee yards now, some of them are still bringing it in. Aloha from the big island of Hawaii. All right. So I am really wanting to come back to the big island. Um, I've got some of the Kiave honey off of you all's island, and that stuff is smooth. Well, that, that's good, um, Farmstead Smith. I'm, I'm glad the smoke's not too bad um compared to what it could be i guess but i hope that things continue to get better we all get plenty of rain out here typically wish we could send you all about another f four inches of what we're probably going to get in the next month yeah i'll tell laurel that you said that hey terry thanks everything's going pretty well here you know just busy all the time um, i'm starting to fill in drive um with the um, freight company that i I work part-time with, I've only had to work six days, I think five or six days since March. That's been a huge blessing this year compared to last year where I was trying to do the YouTube channel, the bees and working um, 40 hours. And then with the drive time, it added up to 50 hours. So that has been a big blessing this year. And uh, we're definitely, we're, I know it doesn't maybe seem like a lot has changed with the YouTube channel, but there's a lot of change coming. And I think it's all going to be positive. You all will let me know if it's not, um, but there, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on, and we're we're doing a lot of things right now, prep in preparation for February and March and January, and and everyone getting you know how it is. I mean, you start out and you know you're the bee season in spring, and everybody's gung ho, and then you know this time of the year we're all a little burnt out. I mean, maybe not some of us, depending on where we live, but. Um, I'm ready for winter. <laughs> I'm ready for the bees to just stay in the hives and let's, let's do a couple other things like build some bee equipment. Anyways, hope you all are doing well. Hey, I want to say thank you. Um, five forty five for the $5 donation. Thank you very much. That's one of the things that I'm going to be talking about today is we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up. And one of them is we've had some really positive, uh, things happen towards putting in our test yard. I really want to see that happen. I have so much that I want to learn from that bee yard. And I think that a lot of us could learn a lot from um, having 50 hives completely dedicated towards testing products like Apigard and seeing just how well it does alcohol washes. I know some people don't like um, killing their bees with the alcohol wash and I don't enjoy it either, but this test yard can basically be, you know, a way to maybe help everyone determine what works and what doesn't. I mean, it won't be perfect, but there's a lot of different things. It's like the, uh, the Apame hive. I've only got two of them and I'm drawing combs right now. And one of the, the big Apame white hive, I mean like 10 brand new combs. It's awesome. And I really think that the insulation is impacting the bees ability to break out of the cluster and be able to do more. I, I don't know yet. I only have four insulated hives, but so far, everything that I've been able to see between the polystyrene and the Apame insulated hives, they have um, 
it seems like the bees just handle the the variable conditions a lot better. See the yeah the the Jono Easy Vap is really nice. It's a little bit different than the um the Pro Vap One Ten, and you could argue that maybe it's not quite as good as far as the strength of the the, the box. I think that's the biggest complaint I complaint I've ever heard from anybody. But I mean we're lit literally talking a third of the price, and th there's really not a whole lot of difference between the two of them. And the thing of it is, I've talked to John on the phone, um, actually a long time before I got one, just because I wanted to to reach out to him and just talk to him about oxalic acid vapor because he's pretty knowledgeable about um, how oxalic acid sublimes and those things. And I tell you, that guy, he's uh, quite a bit older than I am. He's still kicking butt and taking names. And I really like being able to talk to the people that design these products because, I mean, you need to ask questions i mean i don't know everything i have questions myself trying to learn let's see here but yeah it, it's awesome and i think for the price it is the best value on what it can do for the price for oxalic acid vapor very quick very comparable <laughs> oh my so should I be giving syrup with additives this time of the year? You know, it depends. I don't know where you live, L. Anderson. We're feeding a lot of syrup in some of our bee yards right now, especially on the small colonies. We are really getting it to them. Get it to them early. It, it's better for them to have a little bit too much early, you know, too early than, than it's late in the year and they're not wanting to take it down or they, they can't ripen it. Just get it in there if they need it. Um, I don't know exactly where you're at. So, okay, Mid-Atlantic, Maryland. All right, so your season is coming to an end. If you are seeing your colonies as light, and if I have, let's see, eight to ten frames of bees, and I've got them in a double box setup, double hive uh, chamber setup, then I'm going to want that top box pretty much completely full, especially if I'm in a cold region like you are. And even down here, bees that have a lot of food, are way better coming out of winter as long as long as they're healthy but if they see that surplus food more than what they need they they really brood without holding back compared to a colony that has just barely enough so i'm definitely feeding right now saint germain i'm feeding a lot of one-to-one -one. Um, i'll get to that question here in just one second hey 545 thanks again so do you have any pointers for a new beekeeper looking to install a 12 hive eight apiary in Ohio, five acres of remnant prairie in the middle of mixed hardwood forest. Well, oh, got some more lights in here. You're, Laurel, you're making me look pasty now. <laughs> uh, this is not really making, you know, that tan that I worked on so hard down in Florida is not showing up now. I know it was hurricane weather. We were barely outside. All right. Sorry. Getting back on point. The, the best suggestion that I would have for you is to try to give them a little bit of a windbreak. Healthy bees are going to overwinter really well in Ohio. You're not that in that extreme of a cold wintering area. I mean, it's still a lot colder than here, but I really think um, a windbreak is very helpful in wintertime. I don't know if you all have bears in there. I want something that's easy access. I know when I first got started beekeeping, I thought it'd be cool to have them over here in this nook. You know, that just, that doesn't that look just like a, nice picture that you would see on a calendar right there. The problem is, is usually places like that are really hard to pull supers out of and move splits and move bees out of and all kinds of stuff. So try to try to find a spot that where the sun hits it early in the morning. I love that. It gets the bees started earlier. Um, I really think that it's, it's better to have sun early in the morning than sun late in the evening because the bees will, once they're out working, they're going to stay out pretty late. Um, I think the sun in the evening doesn't help that much, but personally, um, just management, try to find somebody. If you're looking for, you know, still getting bees. Um, if you haven't found a location already, find somebody who is very reputable in your area if possible. That's going to, you know, as best as possible, get some, you know, feedback from this guy. Buying nukes is really, um, 
can be frustrating. I know so many people that get their nukes back and they have like two frames of bees, three frames of bees. And that's, that's an issue. If you're doing packages, um, we'll have some, we'll be talking about that a lot in the future, but um, definitely just easy access. Watch our videos, watch Bob Benny's videos, kill those mites, try to keep good Queens in there and, and feed them. All right. Yeah, that'll work just fine. AWR Farms, I'm doing good. So um, I had a good question up there about what we're feeding one-to-one -one or two-to-one. And we're mainly feeding one-to-one -one right now, but I still have a little bit of time. I can feed all through October. And in some years, especially when it's been really mild, I can feed all the way through November and sometimes even a little bit in December if it's really thick stuff. It's one of the reasons why I like this thick syrup that I have is, I mean, I can put it on straight. It's not going to spoil. It's not adding moisture to the hive. It's basically honey thickness. It is better, in my opinion, to feed it to them thinner and let them ripen it up. Um, but if you are running out of time, two to one is definitely better. Mostly doing one to one right now and doing it weekly on colonies that need it. But we're going to switch over to two to one or very close to it, probably within the next two to three weeks. And um, I've, I've got a cool video I'm, I'm working on piecing together right now on our feeding system. So that'll be, I think, pretty cool. So, Michael, how do we send you email? It's be related, not selling or even trying to sell you anything. So one of the things I, I get a lot of questions on, are you selling queens? Are you selling nukes? Or are you doing this? And the thing of it is, I will let you all know if I have anything extra to sell. Um, Facebook, a lot of times, if I have a few odds and ends to sell, 15 extra queens here and there, I'll let you all know. Um, thankfully, I have a lot of a lot of customers. Um, so it makes it pretty easy to move things. The nukes, we do not take orders for bees until January. And we will let all of you all know, try to give everybody a chance to get those nukes. And we'll also be letting people know other locations of people that I really trust to deliver a good product that might be closer to your area. And we'll be addressing that. But my email is Tennessee's bees. That's with an S not Tennessee bees. If you do that, you'll send it to somebody else. Tennessee's bees at gmail.com. Let's see. Laurel's fixing to help me out here. She does it all the time. Yeah, 545. And um, you're welcome. Thanks for the donation. I mean, we're gonna we're saving all of that right now for investments into that test yard. Um, we're actually talking to some companies about sponsorship, and I've had some positive feedback on that. Hoping to get a little bit of help with that because um, 50 hives, you know, 50, just 50 nukes is a lot of money. Then the equipment set aside, and then the time that it's going to take to actually do the treatments. It's going to be a serious investment all the way around, and I think it's going to be really worthwhile just from a business standpoint, wanting to know what really works and also insulated hives versus non-insulated. I've been really impressed with the insulated ones I've tried out this year. All right. So here's the email right here. I've also got some other really big news. The 10th of October, we're going to have Ian Stepler doing a live chat with me and maybe even get Laurel on here. If we can, that would be even better. Have the whole trifecta. Um, but no, we're going to have Ian on here. So by the way, if you have any questions for Ian, I'm going to be asking him a lot of questions, some of my own, a lot of questions that you all send me. Don't leave it in the comments over here. Cause I, there's no way I'll be able to read through all of them. If you want to send it either to our PO box, which the number is right there, or you want to send it to Tennessee's bees at gmail.com. We're going to, you know, we're, we're collecting questions and we're going to ask Ian those questions while he's on with us. And that's going to be a lot of fun. October 10th, and more than likely it's going to be around this time, we will update you with more information. All right. Yeah, 545. I'm, I'm super excited about the experimental yard. One of the things that, you know, I've been using a little bit more Apivar the last year or two, mainly because I'm just so limited on time. But I really want to get back to using more natural treatments. 
The problem is, is even with Apivar, we have so little actual tangible boots on the ground data. And there's been some beekeepers and myself included that have had some strips. Like I put some in and I just, you can just see the mites fall off almost basically and put the sticky boards underneath and watch them fall. And you stick some in, you just don't seem like you get as good of knockback. It makes you wonder if they're getting a little old or something. And then with the natural treatments, you really have to watch the temperature and other variables. And then there's just, there's just a lot of things we really want to help you all. And we want to help ourselves be more successful and getting some, the answers to these hard questions is paramount. I mean, we've, we've got to do this. Uh, okay. Well, Larry Hamilton says trying to send to you 100. Wow. Um, hey, you can send it to um, our PayPal. Um, Laurel, do you want to put that down in there? Um, it should be in the description. Or you can do it also through... I don't know how to work this thing. Laurel sets this up every time for me. Um, oh, the PayPal one. Oh, okay. The PayPal actually is the best way to go about it um, as far as... Um, you know, they pay, they take a little bit less of, they take less of a percentage for us, but we, we do appreciate everything truly. Um, and it is all being socked away. I'm trying to get a meter over here so we can show everybody how much we've saved up for that test yard. And it is really added up. Did you ever get any response from man Lake about their shortcomings with the equipment after the video, Dave Nestle? That's a great question. And, you know, I actually asked a couple people about that. Cause I needed to order some stuff from them and they answered all of my questions about everything besides in relation to the video that I did. They, they ignored it twice. It might be able to chat with Laurel too. Hey, Hey, yeah. We might be able to sweeten the deal. Um, anyways, yeah, we're excited to have Ian on. Make sure you, um, send in some questions if you have some and we'll see if we can pester him a little bit. He has nothing better to do. I mean, right now they're just, huddling around the, the wood stove, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, we're sweating down here, I'm telling you. Ooh, it's hot. All right. What's your target goal? And that's I'll put that up here, honestly, just for the bees and the equipment. We're, we're probably, in, oh, we're going to be using some of the equipment we already have, thank goodness. We're going to be able to do some of that. But we're looking somewhere around 6000 to $7,500. So, um, I would really like $7,500 because I know there's going to be added expenses of somewhere in there. And some of it's just my time, taking the time to be able to really go through that. I'm wanting to like to keep notebook information on each hive, like have a cow tag on each colony, something that's really easy for all of us to keep track of what's going on. We'll have a, a set of controls. So 10 of them will be dedicated for control, no mite treatments, um, you know, so that'll that'll help us see what the mite populations nat naturally are going to do. Have a set just for apivar. Have a set for apigard. Um, have a set for formic acid. As much as I hate doing that, oh my goodness, huh? Uh, but hey, you've got to do these things. And I've got some friends that use formic acid later in the year. Chopping silage as you type this up on my phone. Make sure you don't chop your arm off. <laughs> now, Ian, um, every time I uh happened to talk to him he's like yeah hang on a second i've got to i've got to do this chore or something like that i'm busy doing this i'm like these farmers don't they know that you know that... oh thanks tammy garrett don't don't you know you got to take a break every now and then you'll end up being as short as i am wearing yourself down all right so yeah ian you got to multitask doing as much as he does so what are you doing for the hive beetle treatment. So I'm, I haven't really done anything this year. I do have a couple test stuff like the beetle buster. I've got a couple of beetle blasters in. But, you know, I haven't really done anything for small hive beetles. I have bunches of hives that have 50 beetles or more. Tough colonies deal with them pretty well. I do need to probably put some um, beetle blasters or something in there. But it's not really high on my priority list. St. Germain, that, that was a wicked laugh. It kind of was, wasn't it? Um but I'm more concerned about mites. Mites kill bees. Um, beetles just, they, they take advantage of the situation, basically. Either they take advantage of 
the colony's gone queenless. They take advantage of the colonies as being um, beaten up by mites and viruses. They take advantage of the boneheaded split the beekeeper made that didn't have enough bees put in it to protect everything, all that kind of stuff. All right, so Laurel's putting the link down below. Um, someone was asking me this the other day, and I and I, I'm not recommending that everybody, oh man, go get yourself an Apame hive. If you look at most of my hives, do you see a bunch of Apame hives? No, you don't. I wanted to do those videos for a couple reasons. First, I'm curious about insulation. Secondly, not a whole lot of videos on Apame out there. This helps bring a whole new crowd to our channel. And I think that's, you know, that's good for us. I mean, on, honestly, if we're not successful with the channel, I mean, I'm back to driving a, a truck. We got to be successful with our bees, successful with the channel. All that stuff. Um, but a lot of people have, you know, kind of dogged me on these China made hives. And so I actually reached out to Apame this week and asked them about that. They are not made in China. They are made in the country of origin where they were designed. The, the family that designed them were from Turkey and they are still made in Istanbul, Turkey. So, you know, I think, you know, there's, I'm not, even though they live in the United States now, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, tell them, Hey, you, it has to be made here in the United States. Um, you know, I do love USA made stuff. Don't get me wrong, but, um, it is cool that they are made in their country of origin. That's very cool. And also everything is recyclable and is made with virgin food grade plastic. So there's that information for you guys. If you happen to be curious, any idea what causes bees to abscond, um, viruses, a lot of times do, if they're having a lot of robbing pressure, if, um, you know, any, sometimes even just for a lot of formic acid or something. I've seen some people recently who have put on full doses of formic acid and send their hives to the trees because it was just too strong. Probably the bees were pretty weak too. Did I miss the big announcement? I don't know. Um, let's see. Well, the big announcement that Ian's going to be on uh, the 10th of October, and so we're going to be able to talk to him I'm live. He'll be up here. I'm just going to sit back like this, and I'm just going to let him talk and say Poland instead of pollen, and uh, and we'll just let him talk about winter beekeeping as I um, wear my shorts. Maybe I'll do it outside while I'm in a t-shirt and shorts, and um, I have an umbrella behind me and a lemonade in my hand or something like that. Um, no, it's going to be awesome. Ian's got a lot of really good information, especially for you northern beekeepers. You know, I really don't have a lot of experience with cold weather beekeeping. And so that's where you can really, really benefit from talking to Ian. Came, okay, do you have any trouble with a snotty brood in early spring? If so, what can be done besides staying on top of the mites? So I have had some European fowl brood, um, especially this year, and our cold spring, it warmed up really good at the end of March, early April. It was great. Honey was coming to the hives in our good bee yards, and then the, the weather just went totally backwards, and we had some really cold spells. It was the 8th or 9th of May, which for us is not very usual, and we dropped down to 29 degrees. I was moving nukes over into jester boxes, and 29 degrees. And I just was like, you've got to be kidding me. Usually at that time in May, we might even have some 90 degree Fahrenheit days. And because we put on a lot of supers on our colonies in preparation, because some of our colonies were starting to, to backfill a little bit in the brood nest, we gave them a lot of space and the bees got a little chilled and weren't able to manage that big cluster and I had some colonies, not all of them, but more than usual that showed a lot of European fowl brood. Once the season finally warmed up and nutrition was returned and the heat returned, um, the, the, the bees righted the ship. But, you know, I guess some colonies that just can't fix it themselves. And those colonies are ones that um, I usually um, kill the queen. I think it's a queen problem. I'll drop in a queen cell, give them a nice brood break, give them a little bit of sugar syrup to kind of help flush that out of their system. Some people like adding essential oils. I really don't count on essential oils or any additives to my syrup. I don't worry about it. And if that, if the queen comes back and starts laying and I still see the same issues, 
I usually drop a couple things of formic acid in there and walk away. A lot of work um, on those colonies. Hey, Ian, thanks for coming in. We'll see you later, man. Try not to work too hard. <laughs> hey, Mr. Hernandez, um, thanks for coming on. Thanks for the donation. How many hives does someone need to make a living on average? Ballpark, maybe 45000 to fifty k at least. That is a, a kind of a little bit of a hard question to answer, but I can kind of give you a, a ballpark, I think. And basically, a lot depends on your marketing skills. I know a lot of beekeepers, and some of them are very personable. They're people persons, like my, kind of like myself. That's one of the reasons why I don't sell to individuals is because I'll, I'll waste $20 of time for a $10 jar of honey. That's just because I end up talking bees with people. I'm very passionate about bees and educating our customers, and it's not profitable at all. That's one of my weaknesses. My mouth um, can get me on, into uh, trouble, and just sometimes it's just costing me and my family time or money. So I recommend myself, if you are in an area that has like a big city, I'm not really close to big cities like Nashville, Chicago, Atlanta. Those are the places where you can get $12 a pound, $15 a pound. And if you're the type of person that can network online sales, you might be able to make $50,000 off of 200 hives, maybe less. Um, but then there's some people, they don't want that kind of um, a beekeeping operation. They would rather run a thousand colonies. You know, they're going to make more than that, but maybe not a whole lot more at the end of it. And they might have an employee and you know, all this equipment and different things. And there's a lot of different styles. But I would I would say at, at the least you need 200 hives if you're wanting to try to do that. And you're going to have to be really intensive with your marketing to make that kind of money at, at the end of the year after all your expenses. Keep in mind that... I think a lot of times when any of us get into beekeeping, myself included, we overthink the things that we need. Look, I, I would think it would, it's totally worth your time. If you're thinking about doing this, go and work for somebody for a year. You know, Bob Benny hires people there. If you can find a beekeeper like that, find someone who is successful, work for them. Then at the end of that year, you know what it takes, you know what it, you don't need to be successful. I wish I could go back in time and do something like that. Should I treat packages in spring? I usually treat, if I'm, if I'm going to get packages like for tests or something like that, I will treat packages usually seven days after introduction, right before, you know, seven, nine days. Once the, I want the queen to be laying. I want it to see some larvae down in there. That larvae produces pheromones, help keeps the bees locked into the hive. Oxalic acid vapor before they cap her first round of brood is a valuable tool on packages to cleaning them up. If, you're, if your colonies get broodless for whatever reason, that is the best time. It is a wonderful opportunity to clean your hives up. I've been doing more and more tests with that myself. And there, it's just amazing when I get colonies that are broodless for even a short period and I do any treatment, they are way more effective, way more effective. It is the best way to do it. It just requires more in, intensive beekeeping. Hey, Byron, hope you're doing well down there in Southern Tennessee, Miami, Florida. So, you, you know, you guys got a lot of good beekeeping areas down in there, but you know, again, I really think 200, 400 colonies, you should be able to make that money. How and what do I need to do to feed through winter, North Carolina, East Coast? And get it on now, um, Larry. Um, throw it on there. Um, you know, our fall flow is fixing to, to be ending. I want to see weight. I like my double colonies. I want that top deep box to be heavy. If it doesn't hurt your back a little bit, it's not heavy enough on that second deep box. Now, if you're running singles, it's a little bit different. But you want your colonies um, heavy going into winter, and, and now's the time to be feeding your colonies, especially a lot of you who are further north. Get on top of it early. Sugar bricks, mountain camp sugar, 
they help keep your bees from starving, but they are not near as good as feeding the combs. If you have plenty of food in your combs, you don't need any of that pro winter patties. I tried a couple buckets of that man like pro winter patty stuff with the pollen sub added. It, 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 it kept them alive. I mean, I didn't think they really liked it that well. I didn't see any positive gains. Feed them sugar, sugar syrup's the best. That's why every professional uses it. It's the closest thing we have to mimicking nectar. And that's why it is the best. We're trying to be as close as we can to mimicking nature. Hey, Terry Day, thank you so much for your $25 donation. If you have any questions, make sure you leave it in the comments and I'll, I'll, I'll get it. So Jordan Gibbs says, what if my queen was dead when I got it? I assume that's in a package and you just got to get back with them and uh you know tell them to send you another one but that's the problem sometimes by the time they get it to you your package is halfway absconded because they don't have any good pheromones to lock them in packages really are high risk they they really are but nukes are as well knowing who you're getting your bees from is is worth a lot and there's a lot of variables my boss slash wife wants to know if supplemental feeding negates the honey being organic knowing to not feed during nectar flow. Just make sure, obviously, like you said, that you don't need to be feeding at a time that is going to be getting that in your honey supers. I'm not going to be producing any nectar until April next year. So I'm not really worried right now what I'm feeding is going to be around at that point. Big, strong colonies. And you're going to see in my videos in March, they are going to be more than double deep strong. And they're going to have consumed all that other stuff. And then we're going to be putting on an excluder and then adding our honey supers. It's not going to contaminate your honey unless you are feeding really close to the honey flow. And that's why, again, I recommend people feed now. Get your hives heavy now. That way you don't have to do it in the spring or in late winter. Um, but, you know, if even if you get a little bit of that sugar syrup in the combs... <sighs> I don't know what there, there really is no accurate measurement for what organic is in this country on honey, but I will say, and uh, I will say that a lot of those rules are ridiculous. In my opinion, not all of them. I am all about organic gardening. By the way, we have another <laughs> channel where we're, we're fixing to plant like a hundred bulbs of garlic and a bunch of other things, grazing chickens. And I'm all about as healthy as possible within reason and I don't like GMOs and sprays and stuff in my food. But most of us have sodas. Most of us eat junk food and all this stuff. If you, as long as it's not in there, I'm not worried about any residues. And I'm more concerned about keeping the treatments out of your, and especially if it's for yourself, but we, we make sure we do everything that we can to ensure that our honey is 100% pure. And I'm really hoping to get it tested next year, just so I could show you all what that'll look like. That'd be a cool video series to have. I've never done it myself. Um, Hey, um, shut up and bold just sent us a hundred dollars. So thank you very much. Very, very much. Um, so you just started your seven colonies on mite treatment, oxalic acid for five weeks. What do I need to do to feed and how and what? Okay. So I kind of addressed the, the feeding situation, but just get them heavy. Very, some people overfeed, but more often than not people underfeed. They don't know what to look for. I want to see brood. I want to see syrup around the tops of it. And maybe even a little bit of capped in that bottom box. Um, bees will eat a lot, especially big, strong colonies. Um, as far as treating your colonies, um, you just started it. I usually do five oxalic acid vapors in 21 days. Um, I am very intensive with that. They recommend two grams for a double deep chamber. I don't know exactly what I use. I, mine are a little heavy handed. And I, I still believe that it's not, if the mite levels are really high, it's not enough to knock them back all the way either. So what a lot of beekeepers do with oxalic acid vapor is they stick a sticky board underneath if you have screen bottom boards. And as they do their oxalic acid vapor treatments, 
They come back two days later, three days later, and they inspect the mite drop on the sticky boards that have canola oil, vegetable oil, and see how many are falling from the treatment. And I think this pro this makes a lot of sense. I have you know, there's I haven't seen any tests on it, but basically, if they still keep seeing ten mites or so after the treatment, it doesn't matter if they've treated six times or five times. They keep treating. And I hear so many people like, "Oh, you're going to stress your bees out and cause all these issues with their colonies if you do too many oxalic acid vapors." Never seen that. If anything. I've seen things to prove the opposite. By the way, I'm fixing to have a video on that subject. You know that mite colony that had 94 mites in an alcohol wash? It is kicking butt, taking names, double deep colony. It looks ripped. And we did two apivar strips on what was like a four or five frame colony and eight rounds of oxalic acid vapor. It took that much to clean up that colony. But with that, a requeen feeding them fixed that colony. That colony right now, if it makes it through winter, which I believe it's going to, I could split it three ways, sell three nukes out of that sucker. Took a lot of work to get it. Don't let your mites get that high, folks. Ah, Larry Hamilton. Yes, thanks again, sir. Very, very much. Yeah, roll tight, uh, Don Bearden. I'm telling you what, college football, if they could just focus on playing football, it'd make me a little bit more happy. Anyways, I'll try to focus on beekeeping tonight. <laughs> Does oxalic acid residues leave residues in the come months later? I am looking, Stan, for that research. I know that I have read scientific data pointing that they usually can't even find. Like if they apply it, they take a test and they see oxalic acid levels are much way higher than normal. And if I remember correctly, three or four days later, they tested again and they were at normal colony levels it is a weak treatment i'm going to try to find that data i've been really busy but i, I i'm going to do that i am not concerned about um, that based off of what i've seen but that is a good question one i would really like to be able to answer um, without a doubt hey richard reynolds man what a awesome name i'm telling you what this guy's must be really cool northern alabama probably a bama fan this guy's a winner How many frames of honey does one hive need to go through the winter in North Alabama? If it's a good, strong colony, I'm probably going to say eight to nine frames, um, fully capped. If it's a big, strong colony, then I'm, I want to see that. Plenty of honey in there um, or sugar syrup, whatever it takes. Again, and here in Tennessee, the maples start blooming usually around the first week of February. It really depends on how mild the winter is in Northern Alabama. It's probably going to be a week or two earlier. And as soon as that first bit of pollen comes in, the bees want to brood. And as long as they have enough food to do it, as far as energy food, and that would be your honey or your sugar syrup, they are going to really take off with those pollens. And I feel like a lot of people, again, don't feed enough and it really holds their bees back. And instead of having these massive colonies, they end up with wimps that are struggling just because they just can't expend the energy because they don't have it to expend. Are pro patties turned into honey or is it stored below? As far as like winter patties, the pro winter patties, I'm sure they basically just eat it and burn it. One of the reasons I don't like it is because of all the, the roughage um, that's in it. Um, that being the, the pollen patty material, the, uh, the, the sub. Um, some people really like the additives. I'm not one of those people. I'm not saying that it's bad for your bees necessarily, but if you're in the north, dysentery can actually kill colonies up there. Um, I can, it, might, it might kill colonies in the south in some rare cases, but it's not the same down here. We can feed our bees a lot of stuff. I know beekeepers, we even feed um, sugar that has some roughage in it, like um, organic sugar that's not been completely refined and have kind of gotten away with it during certain parts of the season where the bees can cleanse themselves and take a, a bunch of dumps, um, for lack of a better word, I guess, relieve themselves. Up in the north, you could kill your colony doing that. Um, so I, I really wasn't impressed with the pro winter patties myself, um, but I don't think they store it at all. I think they, they just use it just like they do the pollen patties, the ultra bee patties just go right into their gut.
let's see. Do the bees drag off dead mites when they fall with oxalic acid treatment? Um, you know, they fall, and uh, a lot of times they'll chuck them out. They'll pick them up with their mandibles. I saw one do that actually recently and pick it up and chuck it out. And the thing of it is, some people, I think, that when they do the oxalic acid treatment, they're like, look, it's dropping mites at higher levels for three or four days later. This is my personal opinion, is that the mites, when they get hit with oxalic acid, don't die right away i think it can take a, sometimes a day or two for it to take full effect maybe they don't hit it in the first day and so we're seeing a little trickle of treatment for multiple days but i just we need more research and that's basically all i've, I've got to say on oxalic acid the more testing that i've done on it the, the, the less i am confident in its abilities to work during heavy brooding times of the year Hannah says, I'm in Tennessee too, wondering what's a good time to start beekeeping. Is it better to trap swarms or get packaged nukes? Also, have you heard about horizontal hives? I have, and I've got one that I didn't end up using this year, and I apologize that we didn't do that. Um, I tell you, Frederick Dunn, who's a YouTuber and has a good channel, has a horizontal hive, and he has some videos on it. Um, I think they totally can be used. Um, obviously, the, ma the management's slightly different. Bees really can fit in all kinds of different things. They're the really tough insects when it comes to cavities. They really are. As long as they have that food and no mites and a decent queen, they can do a lot of miraculous things. Um, but it's best to wait till spring. Definitely order your bees early or start trying to order your bees in January and February, because a lot of times people get sold out by late February and March, or you get your bees later in the year because you ordered late. Um, also put up some swarm traps as well. You may catch five swarm traps. You might not catch any for five years in a row. Um, so treatment-free beekeeping, your thoughts. I've tried it. Did not work at all for me. Um, this That's another thing we hope to do with the experimental yard in the future. I really want to test the insulation and the finding surefire ways to control mites naturally and be super successful with that. And if we can do that in a year or two and get some really good information for us and for you all, I will be super thrilled with that and ready to move to stage two. And I would want to basically in wintertime treat everything and try to get the mite levels down to just nothing. Requeen everything with treatment-free stock that's supposed to actually work. This, there's a fly in here that's it's not liking me very much. And then see if what they actually do, do alcohol washes and see if their treatment-free stock or resistant stock is actually fully treatment-free. Is it going to give us an extra month or two without treatments? Does it really work? And the problem is right now is there's really no, like, I'm not saying that there should be a beekeeping police, but there's so much demand for years, people have been saying, this this essential oil is going to work for your bees. This product is going to be great for your bees. This this bee is completely immune. It's, it's, it, nothing can hurt this bee. The older I get, the more I believe less of that kind of stuff. I've, no, I've seen nothing to convince me that treatment-free is practical. I hope I'm proven wrong one day. Let's see. You know, and a lot of the, and I think some people think professional beekeepers don't care about this subject. There's been professional beekeepers been working towards this for longer than I've been alive and still tinker around with, with stuff. And just it's varroa mites are very tenacious. Yeah, I need to get to that. Um, Hey, Michael Fennell, thank you so much. Sorry it took so long to get to you. We really appreciate that. So you're a new beekeeper. That's awesome. I bought a nuke and did a mite test. I had 12 mites and 300 bees. I treated with Apivar and retested. I had one mite, 12 frames of, of bees. I'm seeing bees with deformed wing virus. Is there any hope for my colony? So you said you had one mite. Is that with another alcohol wash that you had the one mite? Um, if you could kind of let me know if you were able to determine if the Apivar worked well for you um, at reducing them. Because what can happen sometimes is even after you've eliminated the mites, if the viruses have kind of gotten a hold 
of the colony a little bit and, and really got in their system, the mites can be gone. The virus is still be affecting your bees. The viruses are actually a little bit worse than the mites. Um, hey, Laurel, can you get the charge cord for this? But yeah, just uh, give me a message down below and Laurel and I will be looking for it. Richard says, can I feed fresh maple water out of the tree? You know, I have heard some people say that they um, have thought about doing that. The problem with it is, you know, maple water basically out of the tree is so low in sugar content. Um, I doubt that they would even hardly fool with it. I mean, they might a little bit, but there's also roughage in there that's rough on the bee system. And there's, I don't know what the percentage of sugar content in there is, but it is super low. Yeah, it's charging now. Sorry about that. I had to get this computer charged so um, we didn't just crash on everybody. <laughs> Whoops, what did you do? We're experiencing tef technical difficulties right now. Laurel said I should start using my big voice for the for the live chat videos. That would be kind of fun. Problem is, everyone's heard my regular voice now. Yeah, I know, guys. I'm I'm ready to kill that fly myself. It is really driving me nuts. Yeah, they can see it. I nearly had it. It's on my head. Laurel's like, hold still for just one minute. This could this could be the end of the live chat right here. I might 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 knock me out. All right. So Michael says I've got one mite using alcohol wash. I have only used Apivar and powdered sugar during inspection. Thanks. So, okay, so you took an alcohol wash, you did another one afterwards, and you after treatment, you only got one mite. That is really good. Um, there, You can still have some deformed wing virus, even if you've knocked your mites um, back significantly. I would keep an eye on that colony. Um, put a message in one of my v upcoming videos and just let me know kind of what you're seeing because the mite load should be down pretty good if they need some food get it to them and um, hopefully that'll they'll clear out that deformed wing virus but even if you might have one or two that that have it and say you only have 50 mites in the hive or 20 mites in the whole hive what happens if for whatever reason you have two mites go into the same cell the bee that's going to come out of there it could have deformed wing virus and most of your bees be healthy so sometimes you see it and actually the mite levels are pretty low so it's just kind of part of beekeeping sometimes. But if you're seeing a lot of it, um, you might need to take some action. Yeah, 2% sugar in maple sap. That is extremely low. So my bees are only drawing out the middle five frames and refuse to draw outwards. What's the deal? Well, maybe one, they've stopped if the population isn't expanding, that might be part of it. Also, sometimes if it's cool, they just don't want to go to those outer frames. They definitely prefer what's in the center because it's easier to keep that area warm. If there's no brood in those frames, you might, I would take them and move them to the outer edge and take the foundation and move it towards the center. But it's getting late in the year to be drawing foundation, at least in areas like mine. I've got one hive drawing foundation, and that is the Apame hive. By the way, I just want to remind everybody... Ian Stepler, the Canadian beekeeper, if any of you have watched his videos, is going to be on October the 10th. He is going to be, you're going to be able to see him, ask him questions, but also send me questions either through the mail at the P.O. box number behind me at tennesseesbees at gmail.com. So that's right there, just Tennessee with an S on the end, bees at gmail.com. And you can ask, have your questions, just send them to me early. We want to prep some of these questions that would be really great. You can totally overfeed your bees, um, for sure. You can uh, backfill the brood nest. You can even cause them to swarm at certain times of the year. But there's a balance there. Uh, it's I've got a couple of videos on it. It's one, kind of one of those things. It's an art form. Feed a little bit at a time, um, especially if you're a new beekeeper and you really don't know how far it goes like one to one does not go very far if you feed a gallon of it that that as it condense that down to honey thickness that does not go very far but if you're feeding 
two gallons or three gallons and you're doing it every week, man, that adds up quick. And then, excuse me, if you're doing that while there's a honey flow going on, yeah, you can backfill really fast. Do you put anything in your swarm traps other than drawn comb? I usually put one old drawn brood comb. They absolutely love it. Usually it has a lot of drone comb. Some reason that is a cold comb. Maybe it's super old. Got a, par a partially broken frame or whatever. And then the rest is frames of uh, foundation or starter strips, something. There is nothing I ha uh, a few things I hate as much as do getting a, a nice big swarm filling up and making all this beautiful comb and then having to go in there and cut it up and band it and destroy a lot of their work and it's it's usually the bees are very aggressive when you do that i like to stick frames in their foundation level it up um that is awesome um, i caught on accident four swarms and swarm traps this year i did not put up any this year i just had some left over from the year before didn't bait them at all and still caught four swarm traps this year. Let's see. I have a screen bottom. Should I put a plastic sheet? I have some sign board that is large enough or should I look at formic acid or thiamol? I have all three treatments available. I don't have a lot of experience with formic and what little I do is not very good. I have some friends who say they're very successful with formic and I trust them because their bees look good and I have seen some of the results of their labor with their bees, but they use formic when the season gets cooler and not during hot times of the year and they say it works good for them. Um, I like thymol in the form of apigard, oxalic acid. I mean, um, all of those I think will work, but you're just going to have to be careful. Definitely with formic and thymol, follow the temperature instructions and make sure the colonies are ventilated as is written on the label. Hannah asks, how did you get into beekeeping? Did you take classes, self-taught, learn from family and friends? All right. So this is going to be a story that I think is going to be really beneficial for new beekeepers, especially. So I started off probably is very similar to all of you. I got into beekeeping because it was cool and I wanted to make some honey of my own. And, uh, you know, also wanted just to be around bees because once you see them do what they do, I mean, it's just, it's mind blowing. There's nothing else like it in the whole world. I was at a sorghum festival helping make sorghum molasses. And I also was, um, the bluegrass band playing there. So while I was playing bluegrass, I, I helped with the sorghum in between shows and then there was a fellow that was selling two different collars of honey, which I didn't know there was multiple collars at that time. I was uh, 14, I think, at this time, 14 or 15. And it was fall about this time of the year. And he let me try some of it. Blew my mind away. Sorghum's good, but I prefer honey better myself. And he had an observation hive there, and that was all it took. I literally had five hives I bought from somebody within the month. By October, I had bees, and that was a terrible way to start. I didn't know how to inspect them. I didn't inspect them until March because people were telling me, hey, don't get into your bees in these 50-degree days, and if you don't know what to look for, it's probably best if you don't. You can chill brood that way, but I didn't feed them enough, and also I think the mites were way out of proportion. The guy was just getting out of bees and didn't treat for mites, and now knowing what I do and remembering what it looked like, I probably lost, I'm pretty sure I lost two to mites and two just to starvation because they were nice big colonies and they just, they, their heads were in the cells. There was dead bees in the bottom and, I, and I, I had one good hive come out of winter and it swarmed on me. <laughs> Huge swarm, biggest swarm I've ever caught to this day. It was like that big around. It drew a double deep of foundation in less than 10 days and it made a honey crop for me the first year not a lot but a little bit and i had the original colony but i lost both of those hives the followings um over the course of the next season because i didn't treat for mites at all and as the time went on I, I experimented with a lot of things but that's how i got into it it was not the best way to get into it getting a, a mentor can really help unless they're an idiot and then it could really set you back and um, there are there are a lot of people out there in beekeeping who 
act like they are God's gift to the beekeeping world. And I, I try not to be that person. Um, I really like to share people like Bob Benny. If you haven't subscribed to his channel or Ian's channel or Frederick Dunn, these fundamental guys, great information. We are not the only source of information out there. But there are a lot of people out there that base so much on opinions and what they want and not actual what's real. And beekeeping is so complicated. Beekeeping is behind the times. We have let it get behind the times. And that's one of the reasons I want to put this experimental yard in. I am and other people, I'm so thankful for Ian, for Bob Benny, Frederick Dunn, and, and Richard, and a couple other people like them, University of Gulf, putting out solid information. This is going to propel the industry forward so much. There's been no excuse for the lack of education that has been going on in beekeeping. And uh, it is is really a shame. It nearly got me out because I, after about four or five years of just losing bees, seventy percent losses, eighty percent losses, then I tried treatment free losses, losses, losses. Buy treatment free bees from treatment free gurus. Losses, just cannot get any consistency. I, I really just stopped. I basically had a couple hives. What happened happened. I didn't get honey for multiple years. And then I decided one day that I was going to take this seriously instead of focusing on pastured poultry. At that time, I was doing about 2,000 chickens a year. By the way, we've got a whole other channel if you want to learn how to raise free-range chickens and garden and stuff like that. We've got about seven videos. Just got that started up. And um, the information is very fundamental and good as well. Um, I'm not bra patting myself on the back, but I have literally spent tens of thousands of dollars getting that information the hard way. Anyways, try to get off of um, my stories here, but totally didn't learn from families or, or friends. I didn't, I did take some classes here in Tennessee. Some of them were good. Some of them were terrible. You spend money for something, you should get your money's worth out of it. And um, my biggest regret is listening to certain, some people that really set me back multiple years, but it was my choice to do that. And also not going to somebody who I knew was legit and living off of their bees. If you can live off of honeybees, you know something about bees because it's not easy to do. It's not. I wish I would have gone and le learned from one of those. I could have learned what took me eight to 10 years trial and error in a year two years working for somebody who actually already knew all that stuff. Would you recommend poly hives over wooden? I don't know enough about them yet, but they do work really good. And I've got to say that between my poly styrene hives from blue sky bee supply that they donated to the channel, which I'm going to be doing a follow-up video on one of those real soon in the Apame hive um, two hives that I have, I am very impressed with both of those. And I'm scratching my head a little bit more on is insulation that important? A lot of people argue, especially in other countries, that it is. And it kind of makes sense to me. We insulate our houses to save energy. It's less work for the bees to um, cool and warm the hive. So I'm, I'm impressed with it. I do prefer, in my opinion, the Apame over the polystyrene, though, just because they're tougher as far as when I use the hive tool on them, I feel like um, they can take a lot more abuse. I really love the pollen trap of the Apame. And when I got that hive, I didn't know what I was going to get. Um, it could have been a gimmicky product. But the only thing about Apame that I haven't really enjoyed is the plastic frames, but I hate acorn and Pierco plastic frames also. So it's, that's really not a big deal. It, it'll use wooden frames just fine. But that's why we need that experimental yard. We need a lot of colonies to test and see how much better that insulation is if it is. Hey, Laurel, can you give me some water? I'm running out of juice over here. Losing money teaches one very fast, Sherry says. You know what? You would think, um, I tell you, sometimes it's not fast enough for people like me. If there's one thing I can say that I did right is I didn't 
stop. I almost did, but I kept with it. And that's, that's probably the best thing that I could say about me beekeeping early on is that I just didn't give up. Yeah, I, a lot of people are saying insulation is the way to go. Hey, Tanya, we are going to be doing classes. I actually am working right now at prepping some. And we were thinking about doing some in fall, but there's probably going to be at the end of January, early February. We'll be announcing all of that. We're looking somewhere around the Lebanon area outside of Nashville, easy access. Probably try to do some hands-on, maybe even one of our bee yards next year. But I'm not going to say everything about what we're trying to do with the, these uh, classes, but the one in winter, I've talked to Bob Benny, and he said that he's willing to come up and speak as well. So it'd be, be me and Bob. I think a lot of Bob Benny. If you haven't subscribed to his channel, do so and uh, tell him I said, hey, that man has, has more information in his little... <laughs> A uh, little finger than I have in my whole body. I'm telling you, he's he's a wealth of knowledge, but he's been keeping bees longer than I've been alive. I'm not saying you're old, Bob. <laughs> Ooh, that's the stuff. All right. Do you need to have your hives down to two boxes through the winter? And it's probably best that you do. I am running double deeps through winter. A lot of double deeps. I'm running a lot of singles into and in through our winters as well. When I got into beekeeping, and I was talking to Byron, who was on here a little bit ago. I'm going to murder this fly. I'm telling you. Um, I say what? Yeah, the fly. I'm going. I'm going to kill him. Oh, oh, oh! There he is. Oh yeah. Okay, we have some relief, but I think there's more than one in here. All right, so anyway, sorry about that, folks. I just lost my train of thought. We have derailed. Roll Tide, Matthew. Oh, reducing your hives. So I was told when I first got into beekeeping that you had to have double deeps in order to have bees survive through the winters in Tennessee. That is an utter load of crap. It is totally ridiculous, bogus. I ran hives that were three frames strong through our winter last year. It's more intensive. You got to know what you can do, what you can't do. But I know other beekeepers in this state doing the same thing. And you totally can do it. A lot of it has to do with having a good, healthy little cluster and plenty of food. But you totally can do a lot of things around here. And not give, you know, don't leave a three frame colony in a double deep setup. Shrink that space down. Help them be able to keep that warm. And that's where, again, I think insulation might be a big um, plus. But, you know, if your bees don't need two boxes, reduce them down to one deep box. If, if, they, um, if they need two deep boxes, and that's perfectly fine. But um, I, I, I love double deeps and I love singles. I got a bunch of singles going through winter this year. And I promise you they're going to be kicking butt and taking names next year, making lots of honey. Best way to get nukes through winter, have a good cluster and have good feed in there. I mean, that's that's the main thing is having a, a good, young, healthy cluster. Just because there's five frames of bees in there now, if they're a bunch of old bees, you need you need some brood in there that's uh, and, and plenty of nutrition to make those clusters nice and strong. I, I really want to see at least three frames of bees coming out of winter in a five-frame nuke size, ideally stronger than that. Hey, Frank's bees, I don't have any ventilation in my hives. Um, I get razzed for that quite a bit. I think it probably is ideal. I just usually don't take the time to do it, and I find my bees do okay. Um, you know, they, I have some videos of triple deep-sized colonies in March, so obviously they're able to suffer through that moisture. And we're extremely moist here, let me tell you. I do think an upper entrance is advantageous to have a little bit of an upper entrance, but I usually don't bother. I really feel like having a strong cluster that has low mites and a good queen is the key to success, and it really is that simple. Hey, Justin, um, hit me with that question. I've been meaning to get to you, and I, I just have not. Actually, you're one of the reasons I started this. <laughs> so you got a hive that split, and the split will not take a queen. I tried, 
and ha- try to make their own, put two in there. For some reason, they don't take any ideas. So, Justin, I have a hive like that right now. I, I requeened it. And uh, it, it for I went through the whole yard. There's like 52 hives. Every single hive besides that one had a queen in it. And this one had a pretty young queen. I think she was under a year old. And they they superseded. She seemed fine. For whatever reason, I came back. There was hardly any brood left. There's a decent bit of bees in there. So I left a queen. I, put a, I introduced another queen in there, put a frame of larvae and stuff to kind of help introduce her in there. She lay, they let her lay for a handful of days and then they killed her and started raising a cell. And I let that go on. The the queen never came back. The hives, a waste of my time. Some hives are nearly impossible to requeen when they get just out of balance. And you can even try to pour a ton of brood in there, two or three frames of brood, and they still just won't do it. Those are problem colonies. We eliminate those from our operation. I shake them out. The bees can combine back with other hives if they want to. I usually give every shot a colony a second chance. If something happens, I'll drop a queen cell in there. And if they don't fix themselves, then I'm done. We just don't have time for those. We got too many colonies that are doing great. And I can't I can't really fully answer why that is. I, I think just bees get out of balance. I have been able to fix some of those colonies, but usually by the time I've done that, I could have just made a whole brand new split with hardly any risk at all. So I just, I don't like those colonies very much. And I, I'd say that I see probably a dozen colonies like that every year. And we just, we just get rid of them. When you check the, the double deep box and find the top box full and the bottom box empty, do you reverse them half? I've had answers both ways. It really depends on the time of the year, Graham. Say, so let's say we're building up for the honey flow. In my area, that's going to be around March, late February, definitely by April. And and hopefully they're bigger than just one deep box strong. Gearing up for the honey flow, I I they're I know they're going to expand. We have pollen coming in like crazy. Bees want to grow that time of the year. I definitely want to take that top deep that's plugged with bees and all that empty space below and drawn comb and i want to swap that around a good queen and a good hive typically will drop down and lay down in there some bees don't i see that as a an issue myself that's an instant disqualification for breeding purposes for breeding queens in my opinion i have some colonies the queen will drop down and lay in the the bottom box and work her way back up in the second um However, if you're going into winter, it's a totally different story. Heat rises. The bees want to be up in there. If you think that, you know, they don't need that space down below and they're going to be shrinking going into winter, maybe just remove the bottom box entirely and, um, you know, store it for winter. Or if they're expanding in your area, maybe you should throw it on top. But I will rotate deep boxes. If there's space down below, I will totally do that. Nothing wrong with it as long as it's the right time of the year. Sarah says, how many hives do you have in total? And, you know, I don't really know the exact number, but somewhere around the 300 mark. And I'm thinking that maybe next year, I don't think we'll grow at all. I, we might actually, Laurel's shaking her head over there. Well, there's the answer, folks. Um, seriously, though. Uh, now, again, the test yard is going to add 50 more colonies, but I think we're probably going to wait a couple more years to expand maybe if we decide to go 500 maybe even compete with ian thousand 1500 colonies 2000 you know all that stuff not um we uh our kids will be older and able to contribute more right now we're focused on homeschooling them and their education Yeah, Sarah, it is. It is a lot of work. Actually, right before I came, I, I got on this live chat. We went through a yard of fifty colonies, um, checked on which ones needed fed. We um, pulled any queen excluders that were left. Made sure all of the queen excluders were off, and that is very important for those of you who don't know. Pull those queen excluders because 
if the queen's down below and the honey's up above, they're going to move up with the heat and go for that honey, and all the bees will move up there, and the queen will be stuck below that excluder, and she'll be toast. Not good. So Ziga um, asked, um, I, I can't pronounce that correctly, so I'm not even going to try to, but thanks for coming on, by the way, and thanks for the donation. I'm new to beekeeping one month, and I have 14 hives. Wow, you and I are going to be good friends. You're, you're, you're very zealous. Um, I got them from a guy who got allergic when he harvested the honey, so I have a mite problem and low food problem. So Ziga, the, the best food, and I imagine if I, if I – if I know where you're at, I think I do. You're in a colder part of the world. And so getting feed on is imperative, if at all possible. Cane sugar and beet sugar refined is best. You don't want roughage in there, especially in cold areas. If there's roughage in your feed, like it's organic or raw sugar that has all the minerals left, the bees don't want that. They don't need it. They're going, it's, and especially if they can't get out and fly and relieve themselves it's going to get in their guts and it's going to encourage bad bacteria and different things to give you an issue but definitely feed them all right so yeah um if they need feed keep feeding them again a, a, a good colony could need in my area i want to see colonies with a minimum of 60 pounds to go through winter you know so 60 pounds, a big colony, bigger colony. A lot of them I like to see 80 pounds. You know, that's minimum. And, you know, if you have little bitty five-frame nukes, smaller colonies, they don't need as much. But if you have strong colonies, they're going to need a lot of weight on there. And, you know, if you end up with some colonies that have a little bit too much, you can pull a frame out and give it to another colony that needs it, even in the middle of winter. Don't be going through and pulling through all kinds of, you know, brood out and frames out, but you can even stick them in a freezer and save those. Now, as far as mite treatments, I don't even know what's legal over there, what you have access to. Apivar is a pretty safe bet. It's a synthetic oxalic acid vapor, oxalic acid dribble. I don't know what's legal over there and what is not, um, but definitely get on top of that if at all possible. And thank you for donating to the channel. Let's see. Will those 300 hives allow you to continue beekeeping full-time, Tyler asked. That's a good question, and this is something I was actually going to talk about a little bit. So I'm, I'm really excited for next year, and you know, a lot of things can happen. I mean, obviously, we've all noticed that a lot of crazy stuff can happen this year, haven't we? Oh, man. Let's not go there. It, but you just never know what's going to happen in life. But I am a believer in not letting that slow me down. You got to be, you have to have some common sense. But also, I would rather act and fail than just to do nothing. That's just the type of person that I am. I've got to do something. I've got to be active. So, where I'm going with this is my plans for next year is to be completely full-time. Thankfully, I'll only have to work that job once every six weeks. I don't think I'm going to need to. I'm probably going to keep it in my back pocket, though. I, I fully see myself being full-time next year with the bees, and I'm I'm super excited. It is This YouTube channel has been awesome. You all have been great, but I've been... It's, I've been very frustrated that I have not been able to fully invest and devote myself to this channel the way that I know that I could because of time constraints. And next year, I feel like that's not going to be there. So I'm really excited about the potential for being able to do some really thoughtful videos. I look at the University of Gulf. For those of you who have watched some of their videos, their videos are very well thought out. It takes hours to put stuff sometimes together. Some of our best videos that have been watched the most and people seem to like the most are the ones that we've put the most time into. Sometimes not. Sometimes we can throw a video together in an hour. Some videos literally take many hours and then research, and I have to back, you know, go back and find data to make sure that I'm not spouting a bunch of stupidity to thousands of people, which is not what I want to do. But next year, I truly believe that we'll be, I'll be full-time. Um, and that'll be because of the bees. Um, the YouTube channel is awesome as well, but um, the bees has definitely got to be the foundation 
for everything. I've got to be able to support myself off of the bees. And, you know, Laurel and I have tried to make good decisions. We should not have any, um, you know, debt other than just a little bit on the house. And that, um, uh, I think that plays a, a large part into it, but this has been a long journey. We have been working towards this for almost 10 years together and Laurel is awesome. Um, that's all I've got to say because and she's like, so why are you pumping your muscle if I'm awesome? That's what she said. She whispers these little things over there. <laughs> Too shy to do it to you all, but she'll let me hear it. And um, she's like, why are you pumping your muscle? Because I am the lucky dude that has you, which was the right answer, wasn't it? What are we having for dinner tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm cooking. Oh, boy. Hey, Kenneth. Man, you are a crazy beekeeping person. I tell you, you've come on here and you've really helped support us a lot. And we really do appreciate you, Kenneth. By the way, that's one other thing I forgot to mention. I want to go through the announcements really quick again, because some people have just come on here. we got a lot of cool things coming up. Ian Stepper is going to be on here October 10th. Make sure you get your questions ready. You can even send them in. We have people that are looking at possibly sponsoring the, the test yard, not a complete sponsorship, but really helping out. And you guys have helped out so much with that as well. And I'm excited because I think we might be able to pull it together by spring and then be able to start with that and have a full yard of 50 hives just for nothing, but learning about the tough stuff and beekeeping. So we can all take it. This is the way I look at it. If I'm successful and learning about stuff that helps me be successful and keep my bees being successful, which is what they want. And I can help you all be successful. It just feeds it in one into the other. If you all are good with three hives and you're having success with that, you're like, wow, this is working out good. I'm making honey. The locals love the honey and I'm going to start doing beeswax. And you know what? We have such a big demand. And since we can keep our bees alive, we're going to go to 10 hives. That's good for the beekeeping economy. That's good for beekeeping innovation. We need that. It is important. It's, it's why, you know, bees, you know, trying to be like the bees is just being profitable and successful. People hear profit and they think it's bad. It is not. It is the way to move forward. And that's the way the bees move forward as well. What is your thought on taking hives to California for the almond trees, also for Georgia Peach, Nor Norch, North Carolina peaches. I know nothing about the peaches. Now, as far as the almonds, you can make a lot of money doing that. It can be a little rough on your bees. A lot of people say that, um, you know, you, you expect a little bit of losses from the stress and stuff like that. However, some beekeepers, I mean, some beekeepers, bees come back and I mean, they're just fantastically strong and uh, even make a little bit of almond honey sometimes. I'm not, not that it's really good to sell. I've heard it's very nasty, but every year's a little different in the almonds. You can make upwards of maybe even $200 some years. And of course that's per hive and that's gross. But then you come back to Tennessee. Let's say you did that. Now you got still the whole season ahead and you've already made that money. You still have your equipment. Now you can sell a nuke off of them. Maybe even make a honey, little honey crop. And that really helps the bottom line. And that's why so many professionals do it is because it really helps provide for their family. And keep them in business. If the almond trees disappeared, um, it would be rough on the beekeeping industry. And it would affect the the smaller beekeepers, too. I really think it would. What? Yeah. I'm not going to say that. Um, but I don't know a whole lot about that. Getting back to the updates. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping um, we might be have some sponsors for that. I've had a couple of people when I've mentioned that say, oh, you know, you don't need any sponsors and that's bad stuff. Um, again, profit and success leads to more success. I mean, I, that's all there is to it. If I don't make any money, I'm driving a truck when not doing videos. So, and, and it's not about necessarily us making money. It's just think about how much 50 nukes is worth. If we supplied all the bees ourselves, I'm looking at actually getting somebody else to supply the bees so I can have 50 more nukes to sell to customers this year. Demand is way higher than what I can meet. Last year, we almost sold out in three weeks on nukes. Maybe five weeks max. It, it was 
fast and furious. We had to turn a lot of people away. And, um, you know, so anyways, there's just, there's a lot to it. Oh my goodness. Um, so two to one syrup, I have a hard time mixing it without getting it pretty hot. I usually like to go a little bit thinner just cause it's easier, but you totally can do it. But I nearly have to get the water close to boiling in order to be able to keep it in suspension. Again, I think our spring water around here has a lot of mineral content, and that does affect it. Um, if the water is full of other stuff, it's not going to be able to hold as much syrup in it. Um, so if you have a you know a lot of mineral in your water, that can make it a lot harder on you to mix your, your syrup in. I, I usually don't get it quite to two to one, but it's, it's best to go to two to one syrup. If you're wanting to put on weight to colonies, two to one. Um, I do sell some queens. I sold some queens this year. Again, um, I'll let people know if I'm selling a lot, but um, it really just, it's a short period of time. Uh, and I usually don't post it on YouTube because uh, Facebook is where you can find a lot of stuff. Like right now, I'm selling syrup. Uh, we have syrup for sale. It is honey thickness pretty much. It's just made out of sugar cane, just like granulated sugar is. It just turned into a syrup form. And um, I post a lot of stuff on Facebook that I just don't have. I can't post on YouTube. I'm not saying you should get a Facebook account. Um, they and YouTube like to censor a lot of stuff that I don't agree with, but um, they can be useful at times. All right, let's see here. Um, one of the other things that is coming up is uh, maybe some fall honey. I've made a little bit this year. It's not going to be a lot. We have we hardly ever take fall honey and the colonies have to be very strong to do so. I, if they get what they need, then if they make extra, then I'll take that. And very few colonies do that in fall here. It's very rare. Maybe every three or four years we can get a little bit of fall honey. I don't really care for the taste for it that much, but it'll be interesting to compare. Hey, Laurel, can you grab those up there, please? The honey. And maybe a little bit of the kiave too. Let's see here. So we'll get some more questions. First year beekeeping. I'm starting to get nervous going into winter. Love all the information. Hey, tell me about it. I've been doing it for 17 years and sometimes I get a little nervous. Um, but seriously, um, I don't get near as nervous as I used to and not hardly nervous anymore. When you're new, there's so many variables, especially because so many people around you, it seems, aren't cons consistent. Very few people can point to you and say, if you do this and you do that, you are going to have a, your bees are going to overwinter. So it, it can make it really hard for a new beekeeper. Personally, I think you need to find information from someone in your area that is doing it successfully if possible. I mean, my YouTube videos can help, but I, I've, not, I've never been in your area before. Um, whew, it is. Yeah, I know. Sorry about that. But really, seriously, just like um, Rodney said, great queens, dead mites, good nutrition. It really is pretty much those three things. You can have issues outside of that. But basically, if you don't overcomplicate it and you focus on those three things to the best of your ability, you are going to have some degree of success. I promise you. Get them, Laurel. Get them. Uh, I, I tell you guys, Laurel's not the type of woman you want to mess around with. Those those country girls and, and the ones that know how to work hard, um, they're dangerous. It's, it's my personal opinion that um, any good woman worth ha having is dangerous. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. She's like, don't call me dangerous. <laughs> you think, well, that's, of course I can't mimic a girl. I, I've got a manly voice. Um, all right. Anyways. I wish you would do a queen rearing class. Norma, we are going to do a queen rearing class next year. Um, if we were not 
so busy. I was truck driving earlier this year. I would have totally done it um, and had a, a hands-on class, but we are going to be doing that this year. That is one of our goals is to bring people out and get some hands-on. Also, the coronavirus whole dealio, a lot of people um, didn't want uh, to get out and about. And we just felt like it was best just to respect um, what was going on. And plus we were super busy again. So it just, it didn't work out this year, but it is totally our plan to have some hands-on for making splits, making Queens, maybe even a little bit of honey harvesting. That would be fun. And what would be cool is people who came, if you have your own honey, we could exchange some one pound jars. And I like doing that. I, I did that with my friend down in Columbia. Um, he has good nukes and a uh, good honey. It's amazing how similar this looks to my honey and it tastes totally different. Um, it really concerns, you know, when you go to Walmart and get a honey and then you go literally to Hawaii and buy some Hawaiian commercially packed honey, which isn't re the real Hawaiian stuff. And it tastes just like this stuff from the Walmart in Tennessee. Um, that's not real. Now, there, I went to Hawaii and got some of this Kiave. I also tried some a macadamia nut honey over there. It was awesome. This Kiave is really good as well. Hello from New York. All right. We got people from all over the place. Yeah, if it's getting close to winter, um, I wouldn't flip boxes. Heat does rise, and it is very common for double deeps, especially the colonies, not massive, for them to not occupy the bottom box for part of the winter, or maybe even all of the winter if there's nothing for them down there to, to do, because heat does rise. Um, and triple deep colonies, which I have it tinkered with in the past, it's the same thing. They'll be in the almost always the third deep box, maybe partially in the second deep. And the, the bottom box is just completely empty. There might be bee bread down there, but it'll just be very vacant. And usually if there's no entrance reducer or mouse guard, there's a fat little mouse down in there who's been chewing up your frames and combs and peeing all over the place. And that is really gross. Yeah, Sarah says Michael Palmer has good um, queens too, especially for northern beekeepers. And he does. I, I've gotten several of his queens. He also has some good information as well. Oh, where do we send the honey? So this P.O. box right here, you can send questions for Ian Stepler or for me in an upcoming video. That's one thing that I um, would like to see more of is if you have some questions and you really want to get them answered, I know it, it takes time to actually send a letter or something, but it, uh, it, you know, I miss, there's a lot of questions as fast as they go up. And as long as I run my mouth, I miss some and it's not intentional. But if you send me a letter, since I get so few of them right now, um, that'll work. But yeah, if you send, you want to send honey here, um, I would love to try um, different flavors. I'm working on a, actually building a shelf for my collection back here. I got this down in Alabama when I was going down on vacation to see the hurricane. And um, that, that was a wild ride. It was like 60 mile an hour winds. But I, I stopped at a local gas station in the middle of nowhere, Alabama, which was awesome. And they, they sold honey there, and I really tried not to buy some, but I couldn't help it. And I've been really pleasantly surprised with the taste of this. It was really good and really good in tea. A lot stronger flavored than my honey. Very cool. How many bees should someone have to overwinter them? Again, you can run five-frame nukes here. You can run bigger colonies. Ideally, for production colonies, I want eight frames or more in a cluster. If, I, if I'm looking at honey production, I want that. But if you have a five-frame nuke that's in good, healthy shape, and she can get a couple frames of brood raised up in February here, and they start getting a little ground speed, and you make sure they have plenty of food and whatnot, and especially if you have some drawn combs to give them for maybe another hive, they can take off fast, and you'd be surprised. You make some honey off of them. Maybe not as much as those bigger ones, but they can still make some honey. Nukes can grow really fast in the right conditions. Yeah, Yo Hunson, you guys have questions. Um, send me send me letters. Um, I really like doing things the old fashioned way. YouTube has its place, but I'm I'm really more of an old fashioned kind of guy. Hey, question 
All right, let's see. How do you deal with moisture during winter? I know if the cluster gets wet, they pretty much freeze and die. And Fat Kid 01, that is um, a good topic and uh, a partial truth. That was another thing I heard. You have to overwinter your your hives in double deeps in Tennessee or they won't make it. Or if, if there's any moisture in the hive during winter, it will kill your bees. Or, man, my bees died during winter because it was so cold. Man, if I had a dollar for every time I said that, we wouldn't need any money for that um, experimental yard. <laughs> Seriously. Cold can kill bees in extreme areas, but 99 times, I'd say out of 100 in most parts of the United States, it is due to the bees not being ready to go into winter. They're not strong enough, not healthy enough, mites, food, that kind of stuff. Bees need moisture during winter. They actually use the condensation for water because bees need water during winter months. They've got to have it. And condensation is the best way to get it, especially if you can't leave the hive because it's too cold. Too much is an issue. Again, I, I we live in a very wet area. We literally got 25, 30 inches of rainfall between January and March, I think, this year. It's a lot of rain. And especially since it doesn't get really hot during that time of the, the year, it sticks around and it's muddy and moist and humid. So our bees have to deal with it. And I don't put quilt boxes in. I don't do anything to suck up the moisture in the hive. I count on a big cluster radiating that heat and forcing that moisture to the sidewalls where it drips down and hits the bottom board and runs out the entrance. A wheat colony can't do that as well. There, but an upper entrance will help with that. Insulation greatly helps with that. Also, uh, you know, someone was asking me this the other day, and I was going to get to this on the, the live chat, and I almost forgot. So, you know, Ian, for those of you who watch Ian Stepler, he uses those, what he calls foamies. We call them double bubbles down here, or Reflectix is the name of the product. Reflect IX. And it's pretty inexpensive. I think it was uh, in bulk. You know, for like uh, 100 hives or 50 hives worth, it was 40 cents each, which is not bad. It adds another value, our value of one, which isn't a ton, but it's it's helpful. I really thought they helped. Um, I really thought they helped the colony. Um, I don't like how they rip when you yank them off because the bees really hate that sound. It can make them a little more irritable. But I've thought about using them on every one of my colonies over winter. And then once spring gets underway, just taking them off. And that um, working pretty well. Hey, by the way, everybody, thanks everyone who has joined our other channel. It is not about beekeeping, even though we will talk about some bee stuff on there. But mostly all bee things beekeeping. I don't want to water this channel down at all with anything else that we're doing. So we have a separate channel that Laurel just left down there where you can go through that link. And we talk all things chickens, um, pastured poultry i've got layer chicks on the way we're planting 100 garlic bulbs we're doing a lot of you know, not a ton of gardening lot like for a business but you know we have raspberry plants and all kinds of other stuff save seeds and if you're wanting to learn anything about that tomato growing in the south we're going to be having information on there and also going and visiting some of my friends who actually do it for a living i'm growing fruits and vegetables and visiting their farms and i think the information will be a lot of fun Definitely won't be doing as much work on that as we will this channel. But if we're already doing it, I figure we might as well do a video on it. Thanks, Ocean State, um, for saying it's a great channel and also being a part of it. I know that it's asking a lot for people to uh, jump over to that platform and uh, and do that, but we do really appreciate you. And, you know, uh, someone said this to me, which I thought was hilarious, is that chickens is uh, the gateway to beekeeping. And it kind of is. I was definitely doing chickens before bees, and... A lot of people uh, do end up doing both. Hey, Rodney um, says he needs to see you, Laurel. Laurel's like, shake it. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, I think Reflectix will give beetles a place to hive, and I've got to kind of agree with that. Um, what happens is that the Reflectix is so close to the top bars of the frames is that they will propolize some of the Reflectix to the top bars, and that's where you get the rip part. And the, the beetles can 
kind of get in those grooves and hide a little bit more. But at the same time, speaking of chicken, I saw that man. He, he took the words right out of my mouth. Thank, thankfully, though, it was you that said it and not me. Uh, let's see here. Oh, so the link took you to the beekeeping channel? The link took said someone took it to the beekeeping channel. Did you actually make a mistake? Oh my goodness. Uh, very rare. <laughs> Man. And you you need to say I'm the one that has the big head. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now Laurel's Laurel is the ego control around here. She's always reminding me of the stupid beekeeping mistakes I made several years ago and some of them I just made. And she's like, just just in case you ever think that you've got it figured out, I'm always there to remind you of those stupid decisions you made a couple years ago. She's like, I don't do that. Are you sure? I think every wife does that to their husband every now and then. I need I, Back me up, guys. And, and girls, you can take Laurel's side if you want to. I think it's a good job, actually. Someone's got to do it. It's it's a tough job. Are mites a constant thing? Are mites are mite free colonies possible? And unfortunately, um, they're they're not. They're just uh, they're 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 in every colony everywhere. Um, now, are there some more resistant bees out there? Possibly, but my experience, even with resistant bees, is that they give you a little bit more time to treat but they are not going to be able to just deal with the mites themselves the mites are extremely good at doing what they do best and that is eating the bees alive and moving around on them very quickly and getting out of the the, the honeybees grasp and uh, we've been dealing with them since the 80s and we still don't have really accurate formulas on dealing with them and no proof that this treatment will work every time in this scenario. It's super frustrating, and I hate that for everyone. I hate it for myself. I was looking through some colonies recently, and um, the Apivar, I, I thought, didn't do quite as good of a job as I hoped it was. Is it because the mite loads were too high when I put the strips in there? Is it because certain, some of the strips weren't inoculated good enough? I don't know. That's where we got to get this test yard, but... Totally, the mites are without question. They they are the biggest problem. There's nothing close to it. All right, Laurel put the accurate channel um, this time. Yeah, the accurate this time she got it right. Man, I gotta be careful. But seriously though, um, Laurel, um, that's gonna be a pay cut for you. Um, <laughs> oh man i wish she she should be on here you, you could see the look of death that i just received it really wasn't that bad but i might be working bees by myself tomorrow let's just put it that way yeah it's gonna be a baloney sandwiches Hey, the new link works. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much, guys, for hopping over there. And um, right now, most of it's chickens, but it uh, we're going to be exploring a lot of other stuff as well, gardening-related. Food is so important. Nutrition is very important for us as well. And honestly, the difference between local honey and store honey, it, I mean, it's, it's gigantic. Same way with um, if you raise your own chicken – your own eggs, all that kind of stuff. And we're all about keeping it successful, fundamental, and easy as much as possible. But sometimes if you don't, I know when I started with chickens, I was killing meat birds left and right initially. Um, not just because I didn't know what to do. I treated them like a normal chicken, inferior rations. And they, they developed health problems because I was, they grow like full size in nine to 10 weeks because they've been, crossed with certain breeds that naturally grow fast and they've just found the best characteristics and put those all together. But that means you also have to get a phenomenal amount of nutrition into a very short period. And if you don't do that, you end up with a lot of health issues with chickens um, of the meat bird variety. When you got a layer, you know, she's got six months to get ready to really start 
laying eggs pretty decent. And but still, there are people who are dealing with cannibalism and other problems inside the hen house, and that that can be something that can be easily fixed as well. Is a lot of it's just nutrition. Hey, Oski Powers, thanks for coming on, for commenting and all that kind of stuff. Where, when do you lose the honeybee drones there in Tennessee? You know, I've definitely seen a decline in the populations where they're just not, the queen's just not, well, I keep correcting myself. The queen probably is still laying in drone cells, but the bees are going behind her and cannibalizing those. I really don't, I think we, we credit the queen with all of these things, but actually it's really not her a lot of times. Um, she just like, oh my goodness, thank goodness, there's a cell over here to lay this egg in, and then she lays it. I really feel like that's more of her rationale if she has one, is just, oh goodness, thankfully a spot to lay this egg. And then a, a nurse bee or, or whatever comes over and like, we don't have the nutrition coming in, and the time of the year that it is with the sun being at the angle that it's at and after the you know the falls here it is not the time to raise drones so they start cannibalizing those eggs and those drone cells and lowering those downs but usually i don't i'll see drones here till november not those are all only the biggest and best of my colonies that have plenty of nutrition and plenty of bee power hey melissa thanks for coming on and thank you for donating to our channel yeah, Laurel, I've been really trying to encourage her. She's su super, super shy, and I try to try to respect that. It's it's really hard um, for me to understand. I have not, I I don't have a shy bone in my body. I never have. Some people, um, and I just can't understand that. I just can't. I've I've annoyed people talking for thirty one years now. And uh, my poor parents, my dad used to say something to me when I was a kid. He said it a lot. Less is more, son. Less is more. I'm trying to do better. Um, but Laurel, um, I'm really trying to get her involved, and I think she will become over time. By degrees, we're working on it by degrees, but we need more women in beekeeping and not ones that are just dolling themselves up and like, hey guys, I'm doing bee stuff today. That's the way it feels sometimes. I want to... Instagram beekeepers, I want a girl to come on here and blow it away because knowing my wife, she's totally capable of it and i know there's women out there that can um, and have the knowledge but i just don't see people putting the effort hey by the way there's a channel called beekeeping like a girl it's a 12 year old girl and she might just grow up into that role um, you ought to check out that channel um, it's definitely a little different seeing um, beekeeping through the eyes of a 12 year old i think it's awesome and and she does really well um, definitely better than some of the beekeepers that are 40 or 50 that have some channels on youtube um so you might want to check that out beekeeping like a girl natalie does a great job and laurel's going to leave a link for that below love to see some support for a young beekeeper we you know we need to get 12 year old girls and and boys into this keep them uh keep them blowing all their money on beekeeping so i don't have time for drugs or anything else <laughs> question how many hives should be the max for three acres melissa you are literally a nectar and pollen thief if you become a beekeeper. Accept this role. You, uh, I'm, tongue, I'm saying this silly, but seriously, your bees will fly two or three miles easily in every direction from around your hive. So on your property, the main thing I would be concerned with is if you have kids or you have livestock, like horses, especially something like the cows or horses or goats or something, make sure they can't knock over your hives, get stung up. Bees hate hair on, on smelly animal hair. They'll, they'll attack your animals, especially dogs. People who've had kennels nearby have actually had dogs killed where the bees started stinging them to death. Once that pheromone gets going, if the dogs are close and can't get away, they'll, they can actually die from it. Um, you know, but I would, I would probably look at 
30 hives, 40 hives. A lot depends on location. But again, you are swiping nectar and pollen from your neighbors and they don't even know it. They don't even know they have it. It's worth it's worth a lot to those bees. Aaron Wilson, my daughter is five, came in and she takes a sting like a champ. That's awesome. And, you know, stings hurt everybody. I've been stung thousands of times. I've never once thought, man, that was fun. But I think that's an important life lesson right there. Our kids need to feel pain. I mean, as bad as that sounds, life has painful experiences. It's going to happen to you. If you're a carpenter, you get cut by splinters and all kinds of different things. It's an important lesson to learn. It's also important to respect other creatures and people because there are consequences. Another good lesson to learn right there. And I love seeing young kids who are raised in these environments because I feel like they have a better grasp of how the world works instead of expecting everybody who's working to pay for them to have everything for free. Go out and do it yourself. Fifty-nine year old woman beekeeper, fifty hives and raised queens and splits for nukes. My retirement goal to beekeep full time. Well, I really hope that you meet that and surpass your expectations. Um, we hope that maybe we can help a little bit with that. Um, just sharing kind of what we're doing and definitely um, keep us posted. I think beekeeping, once you, it, it can take a little while. I mean, our, our videos, Bob Benny's videos, all, all the reading in the world, even going and doing stuff with the tutor is no replacement for that experience yourself, but you stick with it. You build up slow, you, you work your way up. And I think beekeeping can be one of the, the best retirement, even if you don't plan on it for full time, just as a, a sideline thing. There's a lot of opportunities. If you can make honey and you can keep bees alive, you can make money. The market is there. You just got to produce it. And that's what I told Natalie, who's got that beekeeping like a girl channel, because there is a lot of opportunity, especially I think for a woman beekeeper, because there's a lot of guys on YouTube, uh, you know, and let's, let's face it. This is what I told Laurel. I've been trying to get her to do the YouTube videos because Let's face it, man. Do we want to see an ugly dude like me tell you how to keep bees? Or do you want to see a blonde chick telling you how to keep bees? It doesn't have to be blonde. Okay, you're not, you don't, the blonde hair doesn't even affect it. A, a girl tell you, obviously, and most women want to see another woman do it too. Because, well, women just seem to be more put to, you know, just... Why does it seem like women got it together more than guys do? Because they do? Oh, okay. I was wondering why. Okay. I have homemade organic vanilla extract. No place for hives yet. Hey, I know some beekeepers. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Check this out. So vanilla. Look, look at this. Some Kiave honey. You see all that black stuff in the, there? So they've taken pure white Kiave honey. It is naturally thick and creamy. And this is from my um, buddy in the Big Island of, of Hawaii. I, I got some while I was there, and then he sent me a little bit more. Um, and, uh, you know, he, I didn't pay him to do that, or he didn't ask for advertising or anything. He just sent it because he's my friend. But I miss a cool honey, and he sticks vanilla bean. This is my favorite honey combination in the world, organic vanilla bean, natural Kiave honey mixture. This is the coolest thing i can just eat this whole jar in one sitting totally delicious and i'm really wanting to do that with my honey this year i've got some creamed honey videos that we're going to be doing during the off season and winter and we're going to be getting some vanilla bean and making that i'm looking forward to that yeah vanilla and honey i think is a wonderful combo yeah like the woohoo that you get every time you get stung i tell you what i uh I got stung underneath the fingernail. I had clipped my fingernails and got stung in the quick underneath the fingernail. And that is one of the worst feelings I've ever experienced. It really hurt. Yeah, um, they, they take the, 
the vanilla bean and just grind it up to like a fi really fine powder a remedy project and um it is wonderfully delicious Uh, Lee Hart, I keep my job just to spend too much on bees. I, I think I, I know exactly what you're talking about right there. Um, my, my truck driving has propped up my beekeeping in the past and, and my beekeeping addiction. And, um, I'm, I'm really glad to see so many, so many women in, in beekeeping and I want to see, see more of it. Um, you know, being the father of an eight year old daughter, I want her to be able to do I would love to see her take this business over. She's a talker. I I would love to see her do videos one day. I think she'll be able to. Um, and I'm not. Who knows? Maybe she, one day she'll want to go and do her own thing. And I'm I'm more than happy to see her do that. Um, but I want her to be able to do everything that she wants to do. And being her dad, anyone that gets in the way is going to be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, Jimmy right now, he's, he's fixing to turn five, by the way. I just, I wanted to update you on the kids a little bit because, um, Jimmy spends a lot of time in the bees with me actually lately. Um, every time I get in the bees, he's like, daddy, where's the bee veil? And he, he's got his little bee suit and a little hive tool. And, um, he is really, yeah, he calls himself, um, little Cayman, which is, he, he'll put on a white t-shirt like me and try to dress up and it, it is so cute, but it's it's kind of a lot to live up to, you know. He thinks I'm a superhero. And he's like, one of these days, Daddy, am I going to be tall like you? <laughs> Did you just seriously laugh that hard about that? <laughs> yes, I'm short. I'm five foot six. And I said, son, there's a good chance you could be taller than your dad. And you'll still be short. <laughs> All right. What what is a brief yearly schedule for your bees? What happens during the seasons? When is the best time to harvest honey? Treat for pests? Set up swarm traps? Let me run over that really quick, and this is going to be a really a rough job of it, but it'll give you a general idea on the big stuff. All right. A lot of beekeepers think that in February, a lot that stuff's not going on in the bees. Lots going on in a good healthy hive in February here. You know, in January and December, things are pretty slow. Bees aren't doing a whole lot, um, which is good. And it's a good time to hit them with oxalic acid vapor to kill those mites. It's a wonderful, wonderful treatment during brewless parts of winter. So we want to get the hive cleaned up. And in February, with that maple pollen coming in, and then at the end of February, some stuff on the ground, maybe a little bit of... um hen bit and a few other odds and ends um, pouring in then uh, the bees are brooding up i mean they're really trying to go at it if they have a lot of resources and bee population to warm the cluster they are starting to expand and if they can get one good round of brood to emerge and help them with all those fresh young bees they are going to be able to do some great things and then by march especially on the bigger colonies and we run our we try to run things pretty big around here i can have swarm cells by the second or third week in march in a mild winter sometimes it's a little bit later like it was this year i've had swarm cells as early as the first week of march i've even caught swarms as early as the first week of march that is very rare but it can happen and so there are some variables there so in, in March, I am trying my best to keep colonies from getting too big for the britches, so to speak, because they'll want to swarm out of there if they're really big champs. And let's say I had some smaller colonies that are still really healthy, maybe some six framers, maybe some five frame nukes, whatever, but they're building up and they're just a few weeks behind. If this colony is too big, I equalize the yard. I'm going to the big colonies that are pushing, swarming a little too close pulling cap frames of brood and sticking those in counties that are maybe two or three weeks behind, but still there's, but there's no health problem signs. They're just smaller. I don't like to prop up six, sick bees that time of the year. And so I'm, I'm equalizing the yard. This makes it easier 
if I can, the more I equalize them out, the more I'm able to address all of the same things at the same time in the same visit. In April, honey production starts. And if it's a good year, I'll be making some nectar into the honey supers the first week of April. If the bees are powerful enough to do that. And that's why you've got to really be intensive. I feel like a lot of beekeepers in Tennessee miss out on the early spring nectars that are in April because their bees aren't strong enough to really make a surplus crop until the last part of April, early May. And this all comes to great queens, dead mites, and good nutrition and doing everything that we can to help our bees. Um, some counties don't need a lot of help. Those are the ones we like to breed from and select from. But some, like we made some splits in August. Some of those splits I got a little heavy handed with. And they, they're a little bit beefier than the other ones. They're going to probably come out of winter a little beefier than the other ones. Doesn't mean the other ones won't be good colonies. They just might be a little bit behind. Sorry, I'm kind of getting a little um, off track here. But so then if the season's been good, we're focused April and May on keeping our bees from swarming. We're raising queens. It's just a crazy time of the year. Selling nucleus colonies trying to get our nukes to our customers without them swarming out, but also getting them big enough. Nucleus colony production can be a little tricky, especially when you're selling hundreds of them, because the difference between 10 days can be, man, that doesn't look quite good enough to sell to somebody. And 10 days later, it's like, oh my goodness, they're making swarm cells. So it's a little tedious and we really try to time it as good as possible. And it's not always that close, but bees at that stage can grow really fast, especially if there's a strong nectar flow coming in, they can backfill. Some years it, you get a, some years a bad, a good honey flow can be bad for nuke production. And I am starting to raise all of my nukes in my worst bee yards because I'm terrified of having one of those bumper crop honey yields, having hundreds of nukes plug up on nectar, which will slow brood production down and maybe get the bees swarmy on us. So we're going to try to pull honey supers in mid June, if possible. This year I was a little bit later. The season was a little bit later. And, um, so it was a little different this year, but I really like to get those supers off as soon as possible. We don't produce any honey here in July in my area, nothing of any amount, nothing in late June, nothing in early August. <laughs> Get those supers off. That's important. Get them off. Get those varroa mites before they get out of control. They've been building up all year. Then we're just maintaining through summer. We're requeening colonies that show any signs of issues. We've got our treatments on. In August, we're, we're checking to make sure that the treatments were effective. Um, if uh, the colonies need it, we'll throw some pollen patties in summer. Just trying to keep those colonies strong because the bigger we can keep them, when this fall flow hits and it hit really good this year, they can just, they have these huge populations of bees to go after all of this goldenrod pollen and nectar. And so I actually feed feeding a little bit of sugar syrup and pollen patties in summer actually um, allows our bees to be able to gather more of the natural in the fall. So um, it's interesting sometimes how feeding a little bit of a supplement um, actually ends up helping the bees go on more natural stuff through winter, which is our goal. And right now, being in September and fall, our main goal is making sure the mite levels are low, for sure, because that really impacts the, the cluster. If there's a thousand mites in there eating on your bees all winter long, they're really um, wearing your, your clusters out. And um, we're making sure the colonies have plenty of food right now and um, several other things. So anyways, um, that's pretty much what we're looking at. So someone said, so boring, and my response to that is, leave. I mean, Laurel, Laura already took care of it, but I mean, geez, it probably is. It's probably some video gaming nerd or something that hopped on here. I've had that happen before multiple times, actually, and um, they're, they're video gamers. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, I'm, if my information is not what you, you want to hear, I mean, it's that's a wonderful thing about this. You don't have to stick around. Um, but let's see. Ooh. What's your opinion on sugar rolling for mite checks? Uh, Lisa, there hasn't been any. 
my experience with them is that they're not really uh, that effective. Um, and and I, it's hard to get an accurate count with them. That's what's so frustrating. I, I really wish they were as accurate as an alcohol wash, but I've had too many people tell me, and I've also used myself. And if you do a powdered sugar shake and then you compare it to an alcohol wash, there's a lot more mites that show up in the, the mite wash, alcohol wash by a pretty good margin. And so sometimes you'll, you'll think, Oh, they're, the mites aren't not, aren't really that high. And they really actually are quite high, higher than you think. Um, someone needs to look into making a product that will give us accurate data without killing bees. That would, that would be really nice. Hey, Jason um, says, have you ever considered accepting an intern? And, you know, we've actually th talked about that. We're really not at that position yet. Um, for the right person, we might actually look into that in the future. Um, but, um, you know, that, that's, that's not something we're doing right now thought about it overwintering drawn honey supers saw your your stacks in the the barn don't want to use chemicals just last week nuke to wax moss gross doesn't freeze in louisiana I, I, or i believe that's what that is southeast louisiana yeah it's just clean light and air enough so all i can tell you raising hells is that what i have done a lot is if there's a 10 frame box, but seven, no more than eight frames in there, no honey, no pot bee bread, no nothing like that. Now, again, you say you don't even hardly get any freezes or anything like that. So that might be a little different, but I've had some combs out for months right now, even during summer that were completely dry, nothing in there. And yeah, I'll see one or two wax moths tunnels in there, but nothing that damages the combs really. And um, I need to look into where the BT is sold. Supposedly, we're able to buy the BT product and spray it in there, and it provides the bacteria that is going to protect the wax from wax moss. But I, I, I haven't looked into to getting that. Honestly, I just, I just leave mine out. As long as they don't have resources in, and then it's a totally different story. Have you seen the hog half comb cassette boxes? Thoughts. I really want to try those. I have not used them. I've seen them a lot. I know people who have used them. And just with the eye test, I think if I was going to do comb honey production on any size that was actually like a business type dealio, they look like the best way to go. That's just my op casual observation. No experience there. If you're just wanting to do some comb honey though in small amounts i would just use shallow frames they have foundation that's meant for that that's super thin and just like you'd use in the half combs and just um instead of having the sections you just cut it out and they even have square punches and i have used those before and and they work in for small scale but if you're wanting a really nice professional product the hog half combs look really cool and that would be a cool video um, series to do for sure. Hey, Julie, that's cool. Um, tell your grandson next time you're working bees with him that I said, hey, and, and keep up the good work. Um, beekeeping can be very rewarding. I hope that it turns into something that's rewarding for everybody. In your opinion, would tar paper used for roofing be better for winter or foam insulation? Um, the, the only advantage, now keep in mind, I'm not a northern beekeeper that's wrapped a bunch of hives or anything. I did do some tar paper. Um, it really prevents wind and you know getting too much cold wind into your hives. And if you live in an area where you get like 30 degrees below zero, I could see you know, that makes a huge difference wrapping your hives because you, you know, you're just not getting all that wind going through the craps or any gaps, gaps in your boxes. Um, and maybe it can help in a few other ways. It, I, I'm not 100% sure. If you were in an area like mine, I would totally say that this styrofoam or insulation is way better um, just because of what we need here. I think a lot of beekeepers up north are doing, some of them are wrapping and doing the styrofoam underneath the the lid as well well look who it is 
now you're making me look bad. I'm going to have to you know, make sure my hair is good. All righty. Um, but yeah, I, mean, I really like the, um, the foam board insulation. Paint them, though. If you don't paint them, ants and all kinds of different things or bees are going to chip away at them, and they will drill some holes in them quick. Paint them, and uh, they'll last longer. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. I saw something. Came and uh, oh, I saw my name, and then I lost it. The, the, the YouTube thing shifted over on me. Oh, was it? Man, I've totally lost my place. Sorry about that. Yeah, Frank B says, um, watching, helping with the thumbs up. There's a lot of ways that you all can help us without even donating a dollar. Thumbs up, commenting on our videos saying, well, that wasn't too bad or something even, you know, kind of like a half compliment. Actually, Boost, did you know that um, when someone thumbs down one of our videos, it actually helps push the videos? Not, Please don't thumbs Please don't thumbs down our videos. Um, but seriously, interaction helps our channel. And even in just a little ways like that, YouTube's algorithms are really weird. Some of my videos that have done well, I'm just like, this video is not going to do much. And uh, it does great. Oh, yeah. All right. Came and I have a double deep with bees bearding all over the bottom box underneath and both boxes are full. Should I equalize the yard as you say to get them down? Rob, I cannot remember where you're at and I don't know what you're looking at towards, you know, how close to winter that you are. But at this time of the year in my area, I'm really not cutting bees back. I like to let my champs do whatever they're going to. Unless you got a lot of season left, I just let those big hives stay big unless you have a colony that's that's really nice and this guy this hive is just so powerful it can afford to lose a frame but just keep in mind that a lot of the nurse bees that the, they're raising right now or I mean, a lot of the bees that they're raising right now are not going to be in my area they're, they're working on winter bees and so you know a frame of that a full frame you know, once that's emerged out of the combs, could be two or three frames of clustering that you could be losing. So I don't, I don't know where exactly where you're at, but I really don't like this late in the game in my area doing that. Okay, I'm working on it. At Jerome B Farm, they accidentally hit the thumbs down. Anyways, they couldn't. I, I've had some people say that they've accidentally hit the thumbs down before, and I've actually done that. Laurel actually thumbs down my, one of my videos. Recently, she said it was an accident, but I don't know. Sometimes she's a little critical of my videos. Uh, oh, well, everybody's a critic. Hey, hi, Cayman. If you tried any of the better comb products, and I haven't. Um, now, Frederick Dunn has some great videos on it. Uh, Dan Skies Bees um, also has done some videos on it. And both of them are recommending that you wire them in. Otherwise, they're going to sag during summertime. Um, for brooding, it makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't want to use them for honey production, but the bees seem to over time accept them. Some people say they don't work good, but um, I really think um, a lot of Mr. Frederick Dunn, and I, I, I think Dan is very honest as well, and both of them are saying that it's working good for them, and that, that is an option out there. And um, you just don't want to, when you're done with it, you don't want to melt it in with your beeswax because it's basically like adulterating honey with sugar syrup. It's no good. And you don't want to do that with your beeswax, but you can melt it separately and um, make a candle with that wax. Um, so I, th I think that's really cool. And, it's, and you know, some people get really old school about this. And, hey, I like old stuff, I'll, but things do need to change. A lot of the old school stuff was new at one time. That's the way I look at it. It's like the layers that I just ordered. I didn't order Rhode Island Reds or Bard Rock Heritage Breeds like I used to. I ordered a hybrid chicken. I ordered what is pretty much just a Rhode Island red cross with a Rhode Island white. There's nothing wrong with that. They can reproduce. Basically, you just found two characteristics that um, created a higher performing chicken. And that's what I want. And, oh, you know, the Rhode Island reds, they're old. And I think we should keep those old things. But we should have new things. And that's why I think, you know, products like Better Come, some of them come and they go. Obviously, the people decide what they want and what they don't 
And that's one of the reasons why I test a lot of these products out. It's one I want to know myself, but I, I also am trying to help people make informed decisions because there's so many new products out there. There's been so many products. I wish I could remember everything that's come and gone in the 17 years that I've been beekeeping. A lot. So those latecomers, what is the exciting news? Well, first of all, that you're getting to talk to me again, Hi-Fi. I mean, that's the gift that just keeps giving. Ow. <laughs> okay, maybe not. Um, and No, seriously, though. Ian Stepler is going to be coming on October the 10th. Send in some questions if you have them or prepare for them. You know what? I'm going to need some of this honey that one of you all sent me from um, Ohio. A little more energy. Wow. I'm buzzing now. Uh, the bee puns. But so Ian's going to be on. That's going to be super exciting. There's a lot of questions. I don't want to ask him normal questions. I want to ask him some questions other people haven't asked him before. Stuff that I don't know. So I'm going to be sitting down and thinking about this and making Ian sweat bullets. Um, I hope Ian sees this part of the video. I know he was on earlier, but I, he's, he's busy now. He says he was having to grind silage for the cattle. What a bum. Anyways, seriously though, he's going to be on October the 10th. We are, we have some pretty promising information. I'll, I should be able to share more with you in the future on sponsorship for a test yard. And we're working towards that. Um, and also some other things as well um, related to that. We got a lot of stuff coming up. For those of you who have donated on this live chat and other people who have donated in other ways, we are working towards finding some things that are special for you because we really appreciate you and want to be able to say thank you. We are planning to have a, and there's, we have patrons, a, a Patreon um, thing as well that people have been joining. I didn't even know we had it. Laurel set up a long time ago. People have been joining, helping support our channel. And we really want to do something extra for those people who are really helping all of us learn more about bees. So we are, we're going to be having some stuff this winter. That is special for those people who have donated in the past and in the future. Um, that is going to be, um, especially when it comes to the more nitty gritty testing stuff and the, the details um, and maybe a blooper reel video. I think we're going to share that with everybody, but you'll, you'll get first access to it. So got to work on that. Robin Martin, did you start in 4-H or FFA? I've never done any of those things. Um, you know, the 4-H people, um, they were they were scared of homeschoolers like me because um we were just a little too weird and no seriously actually that the, the 4-h people i i have a lot of friends in 4-h i think it's um, pretty cool but um no I'm, we were just busy on other stuff and i've always liked outdoor stuff i've always been weird i've never had hardly any friends my age because i don't like anything that people my age do so most of my friends are older than me or little kids and um, I like it that way. I find older people usually are smarter than younger people. <laughs> it's because they've done a few more things. And um, I think that's helped me out a lot. But um, I think the agricultural programs for kids are really important. Uh, but I ended up just teaching myself, basically, and for better or for worse. Hey, Chip Sleeper, thanks for coming on again, buddy. And thanks for helping us out. Um, I look forward to I'm sharing some stuff with you and uh, other people, um, especially around the first of the year. We're going to have some cool things to for those people who are um, really helping us out. Um, get you know this test yard put together. Yeah, you know, I've always wanted to try those Jersey uh, Giants, Jamie. I never have. Um, Laurel said, uh, "Oh, sorry." Yuri um, says, "What's your Patreon page?" Um, Laurel says she's working on that. I really like a Rhode Island red chicken. I do. I've had literally hundreds of them, and they were a great bird. But I, I wanted to try the hybrid cross of um, the Rhode Island reds um, this time and see how well they perform. Aaron Wilson, how many hives are you up to? Um, 300 area. Um, I don't know exactly what we're going to go into with winter. Like today, I was going into a yard, like 50-something colonies, and there was one I had to consolidate down. I went to another bee yard a um, week before, and there was a colony just like that. It went queenless. It's too late to really hardly fix that. Combine them with another hive, so that's there's a loss there, loss there. 
this time of the year, most of our losses are um, due to you know queen failures just late in the season. And um, some we've tried to fix some in August, and they just wouldn't take. And you know we're not going to fool with that anymore. So we just we just go on to something else. Yeah, JP, I watched him his cows eating those sunflowers in Ian's last video, and that was really interesting. I've never seen a cow do that before. Let's see. B Lord says he's coming to the U.S. in February. Oh, you, okay, so you've been in the United States quite a bit. Well, man, I don't know if I'm going to be in New York. See, was, the thing of it was, I was actually going to be in a few other states. I was going to be in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, um, a couple other places in Kentucky. Um, I was actually talking to some people. That wasn't New York. It's one of those states up there. I think it was Illinois, so that's a pretty good ways away. And uh, Colorado, Springs, Colorado. And I'm still, instead of doing a live um, you know, because of the whole issues with what's going on and people not wanting to get together as much. Um, I'm just doing a Zoom meeting with him, which is not near as cool as being in person for a lot of different reasons. One, because usually in my presentations, I have some really good one-liners and jokes prepped. Fantastic comedy gold. And when you do a Zoom meeting, it's awful because you don't get any feedback. Um but it's still it's still gonna be fun to do that with them. So, um, by the way, if you all have a B club that wants me to do a Zoom meeting, um, I do that. Um, but um, I do prefer in person. It's so much better. I like meeting people, especially beekeepers. So, um, I think I Aaron, answered you, Aaron. But yeah, like three hundred hives. I can't remember if I said that or not. I'm sorry. I'm so scatterbrained. Um, I really try. Don't pat me like you're my mother. <laughs> or yeah, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a big boy. I can handle it. Hey, buddy, come to Virginia. You know, I no, I have been in Virginia. I forgot about that. Um, it was on accident. I wasn't supposed to be in Virginia, and I took the wrong road with a 53 footer, and it ended up in Virginia just a little bit. And um, Laurel, Laurel just whispered in my ear, that's because you didn't have me with you to give, give you directions. I'm pretty decent finding my way most of the time. I made the mistake of following my GPS, which stands for getting people stuck. Chris says, I've been doing, been using the Dawn dish detergent for mite washes instead of alcohol, as suggested by Randy Oliver, and is working great. Two tablespoons per gallon. Thanks for sharing that, Chris. Um, I'm going to be trying that here in the near future myself. Norma says, what's your thought on Ross rounds? I have seen too many people get them and then end up selling them later. I just don't think, I just don't really like them. I, I've heard too many people say that they didn't work well. Um, for them. I don't think the bees like to accept them as well, especially because you think of all of the, since you're using something that's round and it is pretty, I'm not saying they won't work. You can, but you have to have bees that are really strong, not swarmy and a lot of a flow going on. And you, your bees lose a lot of honey production because of that. And the bees just, they're, they don't want to make a little round comb. They want to make, I honestly, in, in my opinion, bees prefer bigger combs. And all the cutouts that I've done, when the bees have the space to do it, they don't make little dinky combs. They make sheets. I have done some cutouts that were, uh, that maybe that's not that impressive, but they were about as long as I am tall. And I, I know some of you guys have watched other YouTubers that basically do just cutouts, um, like a Dirt Rooster and stuff like that for the most part. Randy and... Uh, you know, bees prefer bigger combs, so they just, they don't like to take to them is what I've heard, but I don't have any experience with them. But I don't think I would, I have no desire to really try those myself. Do you know of some good way to ship glass honey jars across the U.S.? Um, wrap them in a lot of bubble wrap, but Priority Flat Rate has some interesting deals, but if you're on a, a time crunch... And it's free insurance up to $50, which is nice. But if you're on a deadline, make sure you send it out before you need it there. Because um, we've had a lot of issues with stuff not arriving when they even say that they're going to be able to do it. 
even if you pay for two day or whatever, which is frustrating if you're shipping Queens or something. I that's why I prefer UPS to ship Queens and stuff like that. Let's see. Um, yeah, that's right, Don. Hit that thumbs up and roll tide. Poor Oklahoma and LSU. It's a rough way to start the season. Yeah, L. Anderson. That's that's kind of the way I feel about it too. Is a round peg in a square hole. Um, it's just the bees don't prefer it. But yeah, I mean, just make sure that you wrap glass jars really well. I have shipped glass before, but I mean, I, I have also worked with UPS and done a little bit with USPS in the past. And let me tell you, it all depends on how it's handled. And I don't think most of these guys are malicious. I've never personally seen that. I'm sure there's some bums that work at those places. But um, sometimes things just happen. Um, but as someone who actually worked in the packaging industry for two years, and my job was actually quality control on packaging stuff. This was many years ago. And the lady that was my supervisor was an elderly lady. But man, there was only one way to package boxes, and it was her way. And I learned how to package stuff really good. And basically, if it can move in that box, even a 16th, and just just move just a little bit, she would make me um, go over and do that again. And um, it, it taught me a lot about it. But you know what? We, She and I never had anything come back busted up. And we had some pretty fragile stuff in there, some fragile signs. So um, packaging is really important. But the insurance on that is really nice with the USPS. I like that. Do you find your bees tolerate free-range chickens in the bee yard? Um, most of the time, I don't really see any problems with the chickens eating the bees. It's actually sometimes the bees going after the chickens. And the, if that happens, um, the, the chickens start knowing when the bees are actively foraging and a lot of times leave them alone. And then once it is early morning or late in the evening, they'll uh, go over there and start scratching underneath the hives. Yeah, and um, you know we're we we ship some of our honey. Um, we haven't been doing as much lately because we've just been so busy. But we're set. We're going to try to set up a website. That's something else that's going to be coming up soon. Make it a little bit easier to communicate with customers. Um, again, it's just Laurel and I, so it's it's um we can only do so much. But we're going to try to make things a little bit easier on everybody, and also um be a little easier to find if you want to buy honey from us um or um bees and stuff like that. Let's see. Here, do, 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 do. How late in the year are you making queens? You can totally make them in September here. I usually don't. I really want to be done by that time. Um, September is totally doable, but it's it's pushing it. And if the you have to basically, yeah, you have a mating nuke. You can get that queen, but you, uh, you know, that queen's got to get really busy, and that mating nuke either is going to need to be combined or be tiny. I August is is really better. For the end of the season but you can totally do earlier september here but you're gonna have to have you're gonna have something to give that queen when she she'll be a great queen but she's got to have the uh, the nurse bees to be able to to handle her all her uh house needs laurel just posted the usps regional rate boxes uh that usps regional rate boxes are a lot of times the cheapest route So what do you think of flow hives? I think, I mean, speaking of which, the the, the Farmstead Smith comment um, I just read, she actually has used flow hives with success. They can be used with success. I think they're not practical on a business model scale at all. They're just too expensive. Um, but can they work? Yes. Can the Ross rounds work? Yes. I mean, there's a lot of products out there that can work. Um but honestly, let's let's think about this. If I only had 100 of my hives devoted towards honey production, and I needed flow hives for them, let's what's the cost on that? Let's say I can get them at $600 a piece. Well, here in Tennessee, we have a short, strong flow. If I mean, if it's a good year, we'll have a strong flow. But it's short. It's April to um, June. Sometimes it's not even that long, like this year was. It was very short. 
And you've got to get that honey packed in quickly. You can't have a deep box and then a flow high box and that's it. Not unless you keep pulling brood from those bees and trying to keep them small. Hey, Troy Carter, thanks so much for becoming a, a, one of our patrons. That is really nice of you. Uh, really appreciate you, Troy. And if you have any comments, just leave it below. And uh, we'll be having special content for our Patreons, patrons. I keep saying everything wrong. Laurel's like, I've told you this before. Um, and all that kind of stuff. But the, the flow hive, if I've got, I need for my highs for honey production, I want a deep box for brood. I do the single brood management these days. You can totally do double, but then you're going to have a deep on top of that and then a deep on that and then another deep if it's a good hive. My best hive this year still produced 120 pounds of honey. Last year, we had some push into the 140 areas. And some people up in Canada on canola and stuff are like, man, 120 pounds, what a bad year. And I'm just like, that's awesome. What are you talking about? Um but seriously, though, I would need to have multiple flow hives to be able to handle all of that and then pour it out in the time constraints. We're talking an investment of probably $120,000. Uh-uh. Um, but they totally work, and you, you can make them work. Um, but if you can make honey in a flow hive, you can totally do it without – and the, the excuse that a lot of people say, well, that means I don't have to get an extractor. You can get a max in an extractor for a little over 600 bucks. That's going to last you till your great grandkids are your age. Ah, thanks elder lash sending us stuff on PayPal. Um, thank you very, very much. You guys, if you have questions, leave them. Um, all right. So, ah, what was I saying? I was on to something. Yeah, I, I thought I thought that's what happened. Farmstead Smith, um, they didn't go for the flow hive as much this year, and you know I was going to use mine this year. I've got one, by the way. Our flow was so poor this year; it just was not happening. Um, and the bees will use it, but it's amazing what bees will do when there's a strong flow. It's when there's a good flow, everything in life is easy. But in a you know they they don't like the plastic as much and here's one thing that i'm going to be trying out next year if at all possible is the um fully drawn plastic honey supercell frames i've had i've wanted to know for like 10 years or whatever how long they've been around how well they work i don't want to ever go that route i prefer bees putting it in wax however i want to know how they work for me and be able to share it with others because some people use them and they like them and i just i want to learn everything about the beekeeping industry whether it's practical for me or not i'm a curious guy i actually am not wanting to really push up to the michael palmer randy oliver ian stepler bob benny level of having like a thousand fifteen hundred or so hives because when you do that you don't have as much time for experimenting you just don't randy oliver does but um, he's got his two sons to help him. Maybe when the kids are a little older, I can do a little bit more. But I just don't want it to ever get to the point where it takes the joy away from beekeeping. I've gotten to that point some 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 years where it's just beekeeping was no fun. And it was just uh, yeah, it got to the point where I was telling Laurel, is this worth it? And um, things have changed since then in several ways, but that was when I was working a full-time job and doing a, about a full-time job with bees. And that was, that was really hard on Laurel and me. Hey, Vicki, thanks for becoming one of our patrons. Thank you very much. I like that. Um, was that emergingbeak.com? Ah, that's, that's pretty cool. Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I'm reading comments, trying to catch back up here. Yeah, LSU. <laughs> what is your choice breed of queens? Now, there is so many variables just within the Italian um, side of the bees. And, you know, you can't really say 
purebred because there's no such thing as a pure Italian bee. It's just like Americans. I mean, we're a modge podge of pretty much every country around the world. And I think it's getting more that way in a lot of other places too. But um, we just have so much diversity here because it was, you know, so many, there's so many different people from around the world, which I think that's cool. Um, however, um, it's the same way with the bees and the, within my favorite, which is the carny bee, the, the carniolan, there is so many variables and what you might have as a carny bee and what I select for as a car carny bee might be totally different. I guarantee you the carnica carny bees that are in Europe are going to have some different characteristics. There's going to be some similarities too. But think about this, and this is one thing we talk about a little bit more in the other channel. It's, for those of you who know gardening, you have Swiss chard, which is beetroots, and then you have, no, not beetroots, beet tops, and then you have beets, which are beet roots. Same basically type plants selected for different characteristics. Parsley roots, you know, uh, parsley, parsnip, um, celery, celerac. They're just basically the same thing, just selected for different things. Same way with bees, same way with chickens, milk cows, beef cows. There's so much genetic diversity inside our DNA. It is, it is really amazing. And uh, thank goodness. Thank goodness. Oh, Bo Lash was in the... Oh, yeah, Elder, Elder Lash here. Questions. Any advice on queen rearing, books, videos, etc.? Okay, so we do have some videos. If By the way, any of you who don't know, we have a playlist. So if you go to our main Tennessee's, Cayman Reynolds, Tennessee's Bees YouTube homepage, you can hit playlists, and you can see different categories on extracting honey, queen rearing, all that kind of stuff. Now, if you're wanting books, yeah, if you don't mind grabbing that one, um, there's a few different books out there that I like. Dr. Lawrence Connor, if you're wanting a good book that's nuts and bolts, fundamentals, gets you what you need now, and has good pictures. Um, the Queen Rearing Essentials is what I'm needing. Um, that's Scientific Queen Rearing. That's my favorite old school book. Um, you know, Bob Benny just released a video on raising queens. Ian Stepler has some good videos on queens. So does Richard Noel. We, we try to um, do that as well. All right. This is, if I was going to recommend a, a book for new beekeepers to start queen rearing, this would be the book. You know, I don't get any kickback for this. Um, this is a book that I have read, and it is good. It's very good. You can see the pictures there. And if you use this, get this book, and go along with our videos, um, Let's see here. Anyways, um, if you had to do it over, would you do all that you do with honey, queens, and nukes, or stick to one in particular? Did my first cut out? Is there anything extra that needs to be done to the honey before straining it? All right, I'll get to that. I'm going to go along with the, the queens really quick. But basically, this is the book. I've got some videos. or some other videos on YouTube. Anything from Bob Benny, Ian Stepler, Richard Noel, Frederick Dunn, guys like that, I really trust what they say. As someone who depends on bees as a large part of my livelihood, um, I feel over the over time you can see who actually is getting it done. Who's not? I'm not saying there's not other good YouTube channels because there is, um, but those are guys that I, I really trust. Um, I talked to Bob Benny, by the way. And we might actually be having him up here in Tennessee to speak with us. Um, I talked, and he agreed to do it. We just got to figure some things out first as far as location, laws and rules and all that jazz. And um, But we're looking at January, February. I, you know, I was going to just speak myself, but that's kind of boring when you're speaking all day. And I wanted somebody else to speak who is going to be able to really contribute some good information. I think Bob Benny has that. Um, so we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that he's up there. You can meet me and Bob at the same time, and, and we can meet you. Hey, beekeeping like a girl. We were talking about you a little while ago. Um, let me get to that other question up above. 
Hey, Wallace Beehives, thanks for coming on. We'll see you later. So Mark Sipes, um, so if you had to do it all again, would you focus on honey queens or nukes um, or stick to one in particular? You definitely need to specialize. That's something that I've been learning. A lot has to do with your area. Ian cannot do what I can do here. There's no way I can ever run a honey company like he does up there. Um, not in this area. It's just it's not going to happen. You've got to play to your local strengths. I mean, you got to take that into consideration. Nature does not always go along with what you're doing. And if you're fighting against its tendencies for your area, that's going to make it all the harder. Nukes is a good idea, I think, for here. Definitely. Um, queen. The, the thing of it is, if you produce honey right now, queens or nukes, you can do very well. But if you're in a short season area, it's going to be harder to produce as many bees. But they charge more in those areas, usually up north in Michigan, Illinois, Montana, Canada, New York, Vermont. Those places, they charge sometimes $50, $80 more than they do in the south for a nuke. Same thing. They're in high demand up there. The season is shorter. They're more valuable. Um, but I do believe in specializing. We are gearing our business more towards nuke production and looking into going into Queens more. Definitely nuke production. I feel like we could probably be successful with all of them, but we would struggle the most with honey production here. Um, so you did your first cutout. Is there anything extra that needs to be done to the honey before straining it? Um, you know, you can just get those little bucket filters like a lot of the beekeeping supply shops have and just run it through there. Um, and that would be it. You don't even really have to strain it that fine. You can just get some cheap cheesecloth from um, a little you know, local store or something like that and run it through some cheesecloth. It'll granulate more if you have more roughage in there, whether that's particles of wax, propolis, whatever. The more roughage you have in there, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be bad for you. Actually, it could be better for you. But it, it can crystal be more prone to crystallizing, and some people don't want that. Um I actually really enjoy crystallized honey. All right, so beekeeping like a girl. She's the one that I said that had the, the YouTube channel. She says, can we have a colony that appears to have signs of European fowl brood? Would you requeen this late in the season or shake them out? Ooh, tough, tough. And I believe they're in Missouri over there, so they're our neighbors. Very similar weather, a little bit different. And um, let's see here. European fowl brood this late is pretty rough, and it's hard to requeen this late. Even, even if it was a great queen and she had the potential to clean that colony up, she's going to have to have probably two good brood cycles to be able to really do so, at least one good. And you're running out of time here. Um, the thing of it is, I, I definitely, and you didn't say that you would, but I wouldn't want to combine that back with another colony, um, definitely, um, immediately. I don't want to give that European fowl brood to another um, colony right now. Now, would I save those combs and, and combine them back later? Totally. Stick them in a freezer. Give them to a colony in spring sometime. I'm not one of those people that freaks out about European fowl brood. I'm, I just, I'm not. My experience with it has been um, it just needs to be dealt with in the way that you're talking about is if the colony can't fix themselves, if you have time, requeening is great. I don't think you do. But then again, this could be an experience uh, experiment. Um, I, I personally would just shake them out like what you talked about, though, um, and, and just deal with it like that. That's what we're doing with pretty much. We're either if it's clean, we're combining it. If not, we're shaking it out right now and just getting rid of the roughage and, and focusing on the champs. But I love queen cells for this. I saw your video, of course, on your queen rearing and then introducing the queen cells into the mating nukes, and I love queen cells. For cleaning out colonies it's the best thing ever when you have colonies that have a little bit of virus signs or have high mite loads that you're trying to clean up or european fowl brood and you're trying to clean up anything brood breaks are really handy we don't talk about this enough i don't think it's used enough by beekeepers it's a little intensive for new beekeepers i understand something to work yourself up to dropping those queen cells giving that full brood break and letting what, what's happening and feeding at the same time. I recommend that as long as they're not already plugged up full of food, feed them really thin sugar syrup. It doesn't even have to be one-to-one -one thickness. It could be like 
three quarters part sugar, one part water, really thin. And what we're doing is we're trying to flush the European fowl brood, which can get into honey very easily and it can be spread through honey. And we're wanting to flush it out of the bees guts. We're wanting that break of brood so that it's not in there on the brood. Ah, missed it. And just clean the hive out. And the best way to do that is just to requeen. And a lot of times that requeening like that can work wonders in the bee yard. I highly recommend it. Let's see here. Ian just posted a video chopping silage for cattle. Huh. Poor guy. He's working so hard. And I'm sitting here running my mouth. See you, Wallace Beehives. Ah, what are your thoughts on Saskatraz Queens? I've only tried a few of them. A handful. I've got some friends that have tried a lot more than me. Uh, you know, I haven't tried it enough to say yay or nay. I think the genetics are probably really good. But the ones that I tried from Oliveras, I just didn't think were mated properly. I tried some carnies from them too. I wasn't impressed. And I think it I don't I don't think it's really necessarily that again the Saskatraz themselves. I just feel like these commercial operations are not getting either giving the queens enough time to start laying before they sell them. All right. You've got to die. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's that time of the year where all the flies are coming in. And it's my fault. This fall, it's been cooler. I love opening the windows. I let a lot of bugs in. Uh, Laurel's a little irked. Um, but seriously, uh, let's see. What was I saying? Uh, so sorry, everybody. Uh, Saskatraz. I... Uh, <laughs> there's a good chance. I mean, they're, they're really sensitive. Hi, I said that. Yeah, it's funny. Um, Saskatraz, I think, is good. I think Ian's used it and said that they're pretty decent. But really, it's hard to tell because I, I don't trust commercial operations on their queens. I don't. Now, someone like um, Bob Benny, who would somewhat consider a commercial beekeeper, it's a little bit different. But some of these massive queen producers, I have had nothing but bad luck for over a decade with some of these companies. And I've tried them, and I'll come back later and try them again. Raising your own queens or finding somebody that you know personally who raises good stock is the way to go. It's hard to find someone who takes the time to to really get you good stock. And even, you know, when I purchased queens from Michael Palmer's, uh, Palm, Palmer's stock, I think he does an exceptional job. But out of getting like 50 queens, I don't expect 50 champs. You know, more like probably 45, and then you end up with five that are Eh, or maybe one or two that are just duds. And um, some sometimes it's just out of the beekeeper's control. Um, you, you try to do everything you can. Jason with Bama Outdoors. All right, we like to hear Bama. Roll Tide. I had Kathleen. I was at work the other day, and she sent me a... Ah, got it. We have a winner. Do you have it in your Amazon, Amazon store, Cayman? Um Oh, is that way back? Yeah. Oh, I guess it is. <laughs> Let me scroll down. I think this book is in my Amazon store. There's a lot of stuff in there. And by the way, that's another way you can support our channel. Even if you're going to get toilet paper because there's a shortage, you can. if you order off of Amazon, you can go through our links. Don't have to buy a single thing from us or anything that you don't need. But going through our link actually sends a small percentage of what you buy to this channel. And it doesn't cost any more for you all. If everybody did that, that would seriously add up. And uh, all you have to do is go through our link and then just as you go through our link, go, go into Amazon, buy what you actually need. And we still get a percentage off of that. The, I think the cookie on that lasts for what? 24 hours? 24 hours. Go Vols. Hey, I was glad to see the Vols win the other day. Um, let's see. Doo -doo. Hey, Bo Lash, thanks for coming in. Thanks for the donation. Really appreciate you. Yeah, well, and, you know, I, I just think life is all about balance. You know, I, I crushed that fly, and, um, you know, I, I would be lying to say, um, there was one time recently this year I actually crushed a bee intentionally. It was, it was fixing to sting 
my daughter on the head. It was burrowed into her hair and was going for the scalp. It was just her hair was so thick. It was trying to work its way down. And, um, yeah, I, I took it out. And, uh, you know, be at that age, at that stage of his life, probably had a few more days left to live. And uh, I'm a daddy. I, mean, I, I like beekeeping and all, but if it comes between being a daddy, protecting my daughter or my bees, it's not even a close call. I love my daughter. And uh, she didn't get stung. Daddy was a hero that day. Oh, yeah. Laurel's going to post a picture of when. Oh, oh, y'all have to hold it up. Okay, Laurel's going to get a picture, and you're going to see when Daddy was not so cool. So Laurel went on a girl. Um, Kathleen and Laurel and my mom went on a girl day thing, you know. And, of course, me and Jimmy are left to our own devices. Hey, Dan Ski, I talked about you earlier. It's all good things, I promised. Thanks for coming on, Becky Sullivan. Hannah Elkins, all you. See y'all later. Um, and, um, we were left to our own devices. It was guy time. Laurel had not been gone two minutes and this happened. And we, we did have a blast other than the few seconds where Jimmy was crying about being stung, but daddy was a little bad and let Jimmy get a little too close to a beehive. He wasn't that close. He was probably 10 feet away, but and they had been super gentle all day, but it only takes a second. Laurel's looking for the photo, but he got his eyes swollen really bad. And uh, Laurel got back, and she's like, what did you do? I was like, well. <laughs> yeah, Farmstead Smith. I, I, I've i never gotten over, you know, eliminating queens, but literally a bad queen sometimes will take a hive completely out. Sometimes the bees are really good about requeening themselves. If the queen's not performing well, they will supersede her and they'll do a great job of it 